everyone that works at the VA is on the same page and we all have the same mission, which is to take care of veterans. And so having that same mission coupled with the fact that we have researchers embedded in our hospitals, we have a culture of innovation, that allows us to do things that could never happen in the private sector. We are exploring new materials and new ways to provide better services more effectively. The recumbent bike is a relatively new thing for us. It works by activating the paralyzed muscles with very small amounts of electric current. And by timing the activation of those paralyzed muscles with the crank cycle, we can allow disabled vets who have paralysis to exercise either on a trainer or actually progress to pedaling over ground. It allows them to be outside and members of the community, they feel engaged, a feeling of freedom moving under their own power. One of the innovation programs that we have here is the exoskeleton program, and the exoskeleton is a robotic suit that helps veterans who acquired the spinal cord injury to stand up and walk back on their feet. It makes a significant difference in their quality of life and um, achievement towards restoring some of the mobility. This is a great honor that we are just really helping people who uh, risk their life for the entire country. Three D printing is a really cool technology. It's a way of making objects layer by layer. Beautiful thing about it is it really works well with medical imaging data. So when we image a person, we take layers of images, find the important anatomy within that image. Let's say it's your heart. So we can trace out the heart within those images and then send that to a three D printer that will rebuild your exact heart in three dimensional space. Patients have got to understand the procedure that they've agreed to undergo. When you can have a 3D printed model of not just any aorta, but their aorta, the patient finally understands exactly what we're going to do for them, and they can ask the proper questions. We're getting more and more materials that act or mimic real biological tissue, so that you can feel the muscle, you can feel the coarse calcifications that are causing disease. That's just over the last year or two, and it's going to keep growing. I'm excited to see what comes next. With every generation of veterans, they face unique challenges and ones that we can't possibly predict. As our population changes, we must be agile enough and innovative enough to meet their needs quickly and in real time. Transcending Self Therapy, or TST, is a form of integrative cognitive behavioral therapy. TST is a little unique in that it really emphasizes the moral compass or spiritual beliefs that patients have and then tries to develop a way so that they can live in accordance with those belief systems. That was something totally new to me. Instead of like focusing everything on the 12 steps, it was on challenging your thoughts, your feelings. Are they true? Are they helpful? So these guys, yes, they have substance abuse issues. The opioid problems that we're experiencing in this country are horrible but we're seeing a lot of progress and the innovations we're allowed to make here um, seems to be helping to address those. All we're trying to do is help them understand their thinking patterns and behavior patterns, which lead to depression and substance abuse. Well, I'm thinking about in the long run what me and my family, my fiance and my stepson, gotta be able to take care of them. We see patients coming back and saying, this is my 10th rehab, or this is my fifth rehab, it finally clicked. For some of our veterans, being seen at a place that's comfortable for them is essential, being able to provide the care that they need. We have an innovation happening right now that we call Mobile Ops, that stands for Mobile Orthotics and Prosthetic Services. We're breaking down barriers to care uh, for some of our veterans that are having uh, challenges coming to see us at our VA facilities. As simple as it sounds, it's also radical. So Matthew is the gentleman who has worn a prosthesis for many years, but generally not been very comfortable. We've now made uh, three or four sockets for him. 
uh, the last of which we're trying on today, and we're hopeful that this will be uh, a really good fit. I was refusing to go into the VA and take care of my prosthetics. I was walking around on a leg for three years, it was broken. I was so scared to go out in public, you know, and have a panic attack or some kind of adrenaline rush. I feel very privileged, you know, to have the VA come to my home to do my prosthetic care. Seeing the VA taking another step forward to offer a service like this really shows me that they are paying attention to things, they are taking the veterans' feedback, and they genuinely care. I mean, this leg is phenomenal, you know, and it has allowed me to do some great things with my life. The future of VHA innovation is an exciting one. We are partnering with academia, we're partnering with industry to bring cutting edge solutions into the VA. It's not only that we get to innovate to help the veterans here, but now it's spreading across the country. Innovation's hard. It's not easy. You know, it's a lot of hitting walls, it's a lot of no's, it's a lot of failures, and it's a lot of frustrations. So why do we innovate? It's because we know that once we get it right, we're gonna really change patients' lives. And that's why we do it. Good morning. I'm Ryan Vega. I have the distinct pleasure of being part of the VHA Innovation team. And I've seen this video probably 10 or 12 times now, and I still have trouble knowing what am I going to say after that, because I think it really sums up everything that we're trying to communicate. Now, over the next two days, you're going to hear from individuals from all across the country who have one thing in common, and that's a commitment to mission-driven innovation. And I think what a better place than the National Press Club to be and to gather than to tell our story. And it's the story of innovation, not for new revenue, not for fame, but it's innovation that's driven by individuals who drive by a lot of hospitals that are probably easier to work at. But they come united by a mission, driven and passionate by serving others, finding solutions, not improvements, but solutions and delivering care in a new way and reimagining the veteran experience, changing the way that we think about healthcare delivery. And that's incredibly important because as we are in the midst of historic change within the VA, innovation is going to serve an important role in driving and setting the path forward. Now, this morning, you're going to hear from an individual who's internationally renowned for thinking about managing innovation. Because as Beth said, this is not easy. It's very hard. Innovation's hard. Innovation's harder in healthcare. Innovation's even harder in government. But what unites us together, what drives the mission and commitment to veterans is what allows this work to excel. It's what allows us to be here, to gather here, and to see transformative innovation in the form of 3D printing, using augmented reality and new ways to guide interventions, whether it be in the operating room or in a procedure room. And it also is a commitment and a testament to VA as a leader in healthcare innovation, but again, innovation that is focused on restoring hope, building trust, and exceeding expectations. I want to thank all of our partners. I want to thank all of you all, and specifically all the veterans that are in the room. Thank you for your service. Uh, you are the reason why we are here, and you're the reason that we get up every day and drive this path forward. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce the director of our programming for the Innovators Network, Ms. Brinkle. I am thrilled to be here. As Ryan said, I am the Director of Programming Ooh. for the Innovators Network. Um, I've been with the VA for about 12 years, uh, involved with the Innovators Network um, for four, and just one year in this role. And um, as Ryan said, innovation is hard, um, but it's also incredibly rewarding. The fact that we are going to spend um, today and tomorrow 
celebrating this rem the remarkable achievements of um, our innovators within VA, our external partners, all of the incredible work um, that everyone is doing every day on behalf of our nation's veterans is just really inspiring. Um, so the Innovators Network this year um, decided to adopt a solution that we see is fundamental to the way that VA can approach innovation to really help make it easier for us, um, especially when it comes to that transformational innovation that can be really, really, really difficult um, to get folks on board when they look at competing operational priorities, um, basically looking at how we may have succeeded in the past. Um, so it is my pleasure to announce that uh, Vijay Govindarajan, or VG as he is well known, is here to present um, his three box solution to you all. So VG will come up and present for about a half an hour or so. And then um, David Dunning, who is the medical center director of the Memphis VA, who has really, really, really resonated with how the three box solution can help his facility um, achieve great innovations for veterans, will we'll join us on stage for a conversation afterwards. So without further ado, VG, my friend, come on up. Good morning. Whenever I go into organizations, I typically ask them, think about everything you do inside your organization and put them in three boxes. How many of the activities that you're doing today will be in box one? And box one is about manage the present. This is about improve the performance of your organization the way it is constructed today. How many of the activities you're doing today will be in box two? And box two is about selectively forget the past. And how many of the activities you're doing today will be in box three? And box three is about create the future. Manage the present, box one. Selectively abandon the past, box two. And create the future, box three. And what I find working with organizations is organizations way over focus on box one. And then they think they are doing strategy. While box one is terribly important, it has very little to do with strategy. Strategy is really about box two and box three. And what is the challenge for organizations in box three? How are you going to create your future in the year 2030? And if you want to create your future in the year 2030, then you have a job to do in box two. Namely, you have to selectively forget. Let me clarify one thing right away. Strategy for every organization, that obviously includes VA hospitals as well, is about creating the future in the year 2030. That's what strategy is all about. But strategy is not about what you have to do in the year 2030. Strategy is very much about the projects you're executing in the year 2019 across the three boxes so that you intersect with the year 2030. How are you allocating resources today? How is the organization energy focused today across the three boxes so that you stay relevant in the next decade? Another word for box one is competition for the present. That is all about efficiency. Another word for box two, box three, is competition for the future. That is all about breakthrough innovation, transformational innovation. Of course, competition for the present is very important. It is as important as competition for the future is. Therefore, strategy is always about how do you create the future while managing the present? How do you shape the evolution of year 2030 when you're squarely executing projects in the year 2019? And the reason why this is a challenge is the people, the capabilities, the processes, the mindset that it takes to excel in box one are fundamentally different than the people the capabilities, the processes, the mindset that it takes to excel in box two, box three. Yet in the year 2019, you have to do both. Yet 
the people, the capabilities are fundamentally different between box one projects versus box two, box three. This is the central strategic challenge. Let me give you a very quick example to highlight why this is such a humongous challenge. Imagine the year is 1903. Imagine we are in Boston and we have to go to London. In the year 1903, there is only one way you can make the trip. That would be by a ship. And a ship those days took 45 days to make the trip. Suppose you wanted to go faster than 45 days. What could you do? One thing we could do is to call a meeting of the Shipbuilders Association, study the ship, increase the engine speed, study the weather conditions on the ocean. This is what I call box one thinking. This is about taking a system that you fully understand and want to improve its efficiency. By the way, 100 years of doing that, even today, the fastest ship probably will take five days to do a cross-Atlantic trip. In the year 1903, Wright brothers, they focused on competition for the future. They asked a fundamentally different question. Is it possible to avoid ground altogether when we travel? Today, a plane will probably take five hours to do a cross-Atlantic trip. Whereas even the fastest ship will take five days. Not that improving the performance of the ship is unimportant. Inside VA hospitals, today we have lots and lots of ships. We have to improve the efficiency of those ships. But simultaneously, we have to invent the plane. And you would agree with me, the people, the capabilities that it takes to improve the efficiency of the ship is fundamentally different than what it takes to invent that plane. This is the central challenge US healthcare system is facing today. We spend an awful lot of money on healthcare in the US, $3.6 trillion. After spending all this money, our quality is not best in class. After spending all this money, we cannot guarantee healthcare to every American. We need breakthrough delivery innovations to make healthcare affordable, accessible, safe, and high quality. This is the central strategic challenge. Let me give you an example of a breakthrough innovation, a box three innovation. If you're an American company, if you want to enter emerging markets, you can't take business models you created for the American consumer in box one and simply send those business models to India, an emerging country like India, and hope to capture the market space there. The only way you can win in emerging markets is through breakthrough innovation. Why? Because the customers in emerging markets are fundamentally different than the customers in developed markets. Because they are fundamentally different, they will demand breakthrough innovation. Here is an example of a company which did breakthrough innovation in emerging markets. The example I'm going to use is General Electric. This is GE's healthcare business. As you well know, GE Healthcare, they make medical imaging equipment. This would be an X-ray machine, a CAT scanner, an MR machine, an ultrasound. And what you are seeing here is an electrocardiogram or an ECG machine. And GE innovated this machine for the American consumer. Imagine a hospital in the US. If you walk into a US hospital, what do you see? You see a sophisticated imaging center. And in that sophisticated imaging center, you have appliance size equipment. There will be a big X-ray machine, an even bigger CAT scanner, an even bigger MR machine, and then this ECG machine. By the way, this ECG machine costs about $20,000. Now, I want you to shift the scene for a moment to India. Certainly, GE sells this $20,000 ECG machine in India, for sure, to the top 10% of the economic pyramid. After all, even in a poor country like India, there are going to be rich folks 
who can afford to use this? The question is, what about the remaining 90% of Indians? The remaining 90% of Indians cannot use this $20,000 ECG machine for a lot of reasons. The first and the most obvious reason is affordability. You see, on this $20,000 ECG machine, a single ECG scan will cost $200. 90% of Indians, most of them live in rural India. And in rural India, people are making $2 a day, sometimes even less. Now, you can do the mental math. If I'm making $2 a day, and somebody is selling me an ECG scan for $200, I have to work for 100 days just to pay for one scan. That is only to determine whether I need further tests. I'm going to say, forget it. I can live with my chest pain. But affordability is not the only reason why 90% of Indians are non-consumers of this $20,000 ECG machine. They have additional problems. What are the additional problems? You see, in rural India, there are no hospitals with sophisticated imaging centers. That means you can't ask a patient in rural India to go to an imaging center because it doesn't exist. Therefore, somebody has got to take this $20,000 ECG machine door to door. Unfortunately, this $20,000 ECG machine weighs 500 pounds. If something weighs 500 pounds, I can't put it in my backpack and take it door to door. Not only that, this $20,000 ECG machine works only out of house current. As you well know, in rural India, electricity is either unavailable or unreliable. So even if you manage to take this machine to a village in India, Maybe the villager doesn't have electricity to operate this piece of equipment. Finally, this $20,000 ECG machine is an extraordinarily powerful piece of equipment. It can be operated only by a trained doctor. It usually comes with a 500-page user's manual. Well, in rural India, there are no trained doctors. That means, for a variety of reasons, 90% of Indians cannot use this $20,000 ECG machine. That doesn't mean 90% of Indians don't suffer from heart attack. This is my main point. Non-consumers of healthcare in this world have exactly the same problem as consumers of healthcare. The reason they are non-consumers of healthcare is they cannot consume the business model you are giving to the consumers. If they could consume it, they would have already become consumers. If you can do breakthrough innovation, if you can do transformational innovation, you can convert those non-consumers of healthcare into consumers of healthcare. Today on planet Earth, there are 7 billion people. Out of the 7 billion people, only 1 billion have the purchasing power to afford the healthcare that we offer. There are 6 billion non-consumers. I say converting those 6 billion non-consumers of healthcare into consumers of healthcare requires box free innovation. In 2008 and 2009, I took a two year leave of absence from Dartmouth College and went to work full time for GE. And one of the very first projects I got involved in was to innovate this $100 ECG machine. On this $100 ECG machine, a single ECG scan will cost 10 cents. If a single scan costs 10 cents, even if I am only making $2 a day, if I have a severe chest pain, I am willing to allocate 10 cents for a scan. Besides being affordable, this $100 ECG machine is extraordinarily lightweight. It weighs less than a can of Coca-Cola. If something weighs less than a can of Coca-Cola, I can put it in my backpack and take it door to door. Not only that, this $100 ECG machine works out of battery. On a single battery charge, it can produce 750 scans. 
Finally, this $100 ECG machine is extremely simple to operate. Perhaps you can't quite see it on this slide. It has got only two buttons. There is a green button, and then there is a red button. <laughs> you push the green button, it works. You push the red button, it stops. As long as you know how to read traffic signs, you should be able to operate this machine. And GE has converted a whole lot of non-consumers into consumers with this $100 ECG machine. This is the central challenge for VA hospital. We have got lots and lots of ships. We got to continue to improve its efficiency. And at the same time, we have to invent that plane. Another way I can say this is, I want you to take a look at all the projects you're doing inside VA and ask yourself, out of all those projects, how many of them will be in box one? Box one is about closing performance gap. It is very, very important for you to close the performance gap in your ships. And the way you close performance gap is through what I call, you can call it incremental improvement, you can call it operational excellence, you can call it lean, you can call it Six Sigma. These are all very important concepts, but they're really box one concepts. At the same time, ask yourself the question, how many projects you have which are in box two, box three? And box two, box three is about closing possibility gap. You cannot close your possibility gap by using the same principles that you use to close the performance gap. You have to engage in breakthrough innovation. This is what I'm trying to tell you. If VA hospital has to be a leader in the year 2030, it's not about what you have to do in the year 2030. It's about what are you doing in 2019 in terms of projects which will close performance gap plus projects which will close possibility gap. Becoming a future leader in the future depends on what you're doing today. Yet what I find working with organizations is they way over focus on performance gap. Not that performance gap is unimportant, but it's a question of balance. In fact, whenever I'm with CEOs, I typically ask them, I know you're implementing a lot of projects in the year 2019. Out of all those projects, can you name three projects you're executing in the year 2019 that will make you a leader in the year 2030? If the CEOs tell me we are working on total quality management, Six Sigma, operational excellence in the year 2019 so that we can become a leader in the year 2030. I typically tell them, welcome to 1970. <laughs> there is nothing wrong with these ideas, but they're really box one ideas. They're nothing more than table stakes. They are performance issues. By the way, another word for performance management is best practices benchmarking. Best practices benchmarking is not strategy. Think about what happens in best practices benchmarking. Suppose we are General Motors, what is best practices benchmarking? You kind of look around the automotive industry, look around Ford, Daimler, whatever, Toyota, and ask yourself the question, is there anyone in the automobile industry who is doing something a little bit better, a little bit smarter? Then you measure the gap between yourself and the industry leader. Then you put in prog programs to close that gap. Imagine, what are you going to look like at the end of that process? How can you aspire for leadership when auto industry is being transformed by self-driving cars, ride-sharing, electrification, when you are just doing best practices benchmarking with other auto companies? This is like saying, suppose you're in a locker room and you want to find out how bad your sock smells. Don't go benchmarking your socks against other people's socks in the locker room. They're all going to smell about the same. <laughs> to me, strategy is about creating next practices. It's not about adapting to the best practices of industry leaders today. 
the $100 ECG machine is next practice, not best practice. Fast, and if you want to create a self-driving car, that's not a linear improvement over internal combustion-driven automobile. It is a breakthrough innovation. If you really want to excel in three box solution, then I say we need to fundamentally change the strategy conversation inside VA hospital. Typically, when I go into any organization, I ask them, show me your strategic plan. Let me see what you've written down as the strategy for your organization. What I typically get is a 25 inch thick binder. <laughs> well, you can't prepare a 25 inch thick binder for the future. It makes no sense. So much is unknown and unknowable about the future. You can't prepare a detailed plan for the future. In fact, I would say planning for the future is meaningless. But preparing for the future is terribly important. And the document that I call for preparation for the future is a document I refer to as strategy architecture. And that document has to be on a single sheet of paper. By the way, any time you can reduce something to a single sheet of paper, there is a greater chance you can get alignment in your organization. And that single sheet of paper should have five bullets. Bullet number one is nonlinear shifts. Imagine the future of the healthcare industry. Imagine the year 2030. What would be the technologies you're going to be dealing with in year 2030? What would be the regulatory regime in the year 2030? Who will be your customer in the year 2030? Who will be your competitor in 2030? By the way, I am not asking you to predict the future of the healthcare industry in the year 2030. You cannot even predict what's going to happen to your industry today afternoon, much less a decade from now. This is not a prediction exercise, but I am asking you to imagine the future of your industry. There is a fundamental difference between predicting the future of your industry and imagining the future of your industry. When I'm asking you to imagine the future, I am asking you to imagine what is possible in your industry. It is the art of the possible. Therefore, I am asking you, what are your hypotheses? about the technologies you'll be dealing with in 2030, the customer you'll be serving in 2030, the competition you'll face in 2030. And these hypotheses are not formed in a vacuum. They are formed in what I call based on weak signals. In box one, you respond to clear signals. In box three, you respond to weak signals. Because the future is sending signals to you today. Because the signals are coming from the future, it is feeble. It is weak. Based on those weak signals, what are they? How can you imagine the art of the possible in 2030? By the way, the best way you can predict the future of your industry is to create it yourself. And if you want to create your future, you must imagine it first. It is in that sense I say, what is the collective hypothesis the leadership team has? about the nonlinear changes in your industry. Bullet number two is strategic intent. What is your intent for year 2030? Even though the intent is expressed for 2030, every employee in your organization should be able to see the same future. And I'll give you an example of a strategic intent in a moment. Bullet number three is core competencies. What are you good at as an organization? For me, bullet number four is the most important. And what I call annual priorities are nothing more than how are you going to allocate resources in the next 12 months. And you cannot allocate resources in the next 12 months 100% in box one. Therefore, I say you must allocate resources across three horizons. How much resources are you going to allocate in horizon number one? Horizon one is box one. You got to allocate resources to strengthen the core. My rule of thumb is anywhere from 50% up to 70% of the resources in the next 12 months should be to strengthen the core so that you can close the performance gap. 
Horizon 2 and Horizon 3 are examples of box tree projects. And the difference between Horizon 2 and Horizon 3 is Horizon 3 is more risky as compared to Horizon 2. What you're doing in Horizon 2 is these are box tree projects which are adjacent to the core, which are designed to close the possibility gap. Because they are adjacent to the core, they are not risky. My rule of thumb is anywhere from 20% up to 30% of the resources in the next 12 months should be in box three breakthrough innovations that are adjacent to the core. How many breakthrough innovation experiments are you having in Horizon 3, which are disruptive to the core? Obviously, anything that disrupts the core is more risky as compared to anything that supports the core. My rule of thumb is anywhere from 10% up to 20% of the resources in the next 12 months should be in Horizon 3. And bullet number five is new core competencies. Competition for the future requires you to build new capabilities. By the way, if you can reduce these five bullets on a single sheet of paper, you can get the whole organization aligned behind it. A word about strategic intent. By the way, the best way I can describe what a strategic intent is, is by describing what it is not. Strategic intent is not the motherhood and apple pie kind of mission statements. By the way, once upon a time, my hobby used to be to collect the mission statements of Fortune 500 companies. <laughs> once I collected a few of them, I kind of quit doing it. <laughs> because once I collected a few of them, I felt perfectly comfortable, I can paraphrase a typical mission statement. A typical mission statement would go something like this. We want to offer outstanding value to our customers. We want to treat our employees with respect and dignity. And we want to provide excellent returns to our investors, something along those lines. In fact, CEOs feel so proud of that very imaginative statement. <laughs> Typically, they kind of frame it and put it in the head office. Sometimes I'm kind of tempted to go in the middle of the night and kind of steal the mission statements of Fortune 500 companies and kind of mix them up <laughs> and put it back. I have a feeling when employees walk through the door next day, they're not going to say, wait a minute, that's not our mission statement. What happened to ours? <laughs> Therein lies three differences between a mission statement and what I want to call as an intent statement. For something to be a strategic intent, it must meet three criteria. I say the generic mission statements fail these three criteria. What are the three criteria? Criteria number one is direction. The reason the generic mission statement failed this test is if you strike out the name of one company and stick in another company's name, and it's going to apply to a lot of companies in my industry, then I say there is no point of view in this statement to galvanize your employees to create the future. What I mean by direction is let us go north. That's direction. That tells me I don't want to go east. I don't want to go south, I want to go north. Direction means it is the big picture. Direction is about the end of the journey. Is the end of the journey clear? That doesn't mean you know all the steps to get there. At the beginning of every journey, the end must be clear. In the beginning, end should be clear. It is in that sense, I say, your intent must provide direction. Criteria number two is motivation, passion. Think about it this way. Suppose the CEO of Ford Motor Company stands up and says, our mission in life is to maximize shareholder wealth. <laughs> Suppose you're an employee of Ford and you heard these words from the CEO. How much passion does it create? <laughs> Are you telling yourself in the morning, my God, I can't wait to jump out of bed today and go to work so that they can add to the shareholders' pockets. <laughs> we have to create a compelling reason for each and every employee to come to work and say, you know what, I can't wait to get to work because what I'm doing there is so meaningful to me. Certainly in the healthcare, it is so easy to create that passion. 
save lives, change lives, restore hope. These are ways you can really compel your employees to come to work. Criteria number three is challenge. The whole idea behind strategic intent is you define a sizable possibility gap. It should be bold. You must define a huge possibility gap. Direction, motivation, challenge. That's what you need in a strategic intent. If so, what is a good example of a strategic intent? Here is one. Tell me, when John F. Kennedy stood up in the early 60s and said, we will put a man on the moon and bring him back before the end of this decade, why do you think the country got so charged up? Certainly when he said, bring him back, that added to the excitement, I'm sure. <laughs> but we can take the criteria one by one, direction. Man on the moon, how wonderful the direction is. Because all of us see a moon every day. Somebody is going to go there and come back. Everybody can grasp this idea. Motivation, passion. This is about beating the Soviet Union on the technology race. That used to galvanize the country. Challenge. This is a humongous challenge. Scientific community put the probability we can do it at 20%. Optimistic probability, if I might add. There was a good 80% chance we cannot do it. Strategic intent is about thinking big, dreaming big, have a big possibility gap, have an unrealistic goal. Why do you need an unrealistic goal as a starting point for tree box solution? Common sense. Because as human beings, our performance is a function of our expectations. We rarely exceed our expectation. We rarely outperform our ambition. If you start with a realistic goal of the $20,000 ECG machine, you fully understand. And want to make it more efficient, you're not going to end up with a $100 ECG machine. Part of what I'm saying is, if VA hospital has to be a leader in the year 2030, first you've got to imagine that leadership. If all that we can imagine is a mediocre organization by year 2030, that's about the very best you'll end up doing. One last thought, and then I will wrap up. My last thought is this. The metaphor that I like for competition for the future is a metaphor of a marathon race, as opposed to a sprint. You see, in a marathon race, you typically don't take a deep breath at the start of the race and cover 26 miles in one burst. <laughs> That's what you do in a 100-meter dash. In a marathon race, at the start of the race, you have your ambition fixed for mile 26. But you don't run this as a single race. At the start of the race, you focus on the first 400 meters. Again, I want to reiterate, competition for the future is not about what you have to do in mile 26. Competition for the future is, how are you running the first 400 meters? The way you run the first 400 meters should be with a view to create the great company you want to create in mile 26. Strategy should always be about folding the future back. Unfortunately, in most organizations, strategy tends to be pushing the present forward. That is not strategy. Recently, I was with a company which told me they have a 20-year strategic plan. I was very impressed. I said, how did you create this 20-year plan? They told me they plan for next year. Then they added 1% to all the numbers. Well, that's not a 20-year plan, that's a budget. <laughs> Strategy should be, what is your dream for mile 26 first? Because it's a dream for year 2030, it cannot be in much detail. It is only to provide direction, motivation, and challenge. That's all it is. Then fold that future back to the present. Think big, start small, scale up fast, always focusing on one 400 meters at a time. Every 400 meters is an opportunity for you to test a hypothesis. Future is full of hypothesis. That's all it is. Because it's based on weak signals. It's all possibilities. Possibilities are hypotheses. Every 400 meters, you can test a hypothesis. If the hypothesis is not valid, you pivot. If the hypothesis is valid, you double down. Think big, start small, scale up fast. 
I'm a very big believer in the marathon metaphor. How do you prepare to create a future you can't predict is the question. The only way you can create a future you can't predict is to proceed in 400 meter steps. Okay, let me take a minute and conclude what I have said so far. <laughs> One way I can conclude it is, think about what organizations do when their business model runs out of gas. Top 11 things we can do with a dead horse. The question is, have you tried any of this inside VA hospital? How about number 11? Have you tried that? Yeah? How about number 10? Yeah? How about number 9? That seems to resonate. How about number... Then that too. How about number seven? Yeah. How about number six? One way to win. How about number five? How about number four? Yeah. How about number three? How about number two? And how about number one? <laughs> Thank you very much. Welcome David Dunning to the stage. Uh, Mr. Dunning is a uh, two-time combat veteran, um, a Memphis native, I do believe, yes. and is now the director of the Memphis VA since 2017. Yes. Um, so we just wanted to have uh, uh, some conversation about BG's incredible framework. As you, uh, as you can see, it is applicable to the VA in incredible ways. Um, one of the things that I really resonate with most is that it can, it's entirely scalable. So you can use it down to your unit level, to your specific workflow. It can be scaled up to an organization, a department, VA-wide. Um, but really what I'd like to do right now is to um, get Mr. Dunning's perspective on how he's resonated with the 3Box solution and how he's operationalizing it at Memphis. Well, first I have to say, that I've forgotten everything I was going to say when he brought up the stinky socks. I was, I'm gone. <laughs> you know, I was, I knew what I was going to say. Um, you know, I, I've read a lot of leadership books in my 30 years in the military. You always got the book of the month or whatever, and everybody sends it out, and everybody reads it, and they declare how great it is, but it's usually this big hand wave and these lofty, you know, sayings and all the other stuff, and it doesn't get really specific. So with this one, I had a little bit of, uh, I was like, okay, because uh, Dr. Sandal, who's my innovation specialist back here, <laughs> she brought me this book. She bought a copy of it and she gave it to me. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll get to it. Uh, and she kept bugging me. Have you read it yet? Have you read it yet? So then one Saturday morning when I've got absolutely nothing to do, that's ne never a Saturday, <laughs> but um, I go out on my back patio with a cup of coffee and I actually sat down. I was, I'll read a chapter or two. Well, three hours later, I finished the book because I was in the book. If you think he was good up here, Okay, and you were engaged up here, read the book. Because the book engages you in the same exact way. And I, I read it cover to cover. And then I had to think about it for a little bit. And about three weeks later, I sat back out on the patio and I read it cover to cover again. But I focused on the end of the chapters. And that's really where, if you, if you don't read the whole book, read the little checklist, the saying at the end of the chapters where he focuses in on each of the boxes. And, and it was fantastic. Um, it resonated with me because it gave me a construct that I could explain, that I understood well, and that people could. And, you know, it, it let me do away with that one saying that we all hate, you know, the think outside the box. I now got to say think, in, think inside the box, <laughs> you know. And if you read it, you'll know what I'm talking about because it's very, it's very focused. And so these three, I was able to pull it up. I started mentioning a morning report just as a sort of a teaser. And then we had our strategic conference uh, back in July. And my first slide on there, I didn't go through mission and vision, all that. I threw up the three-box solution. And I started talking to um, my, all my leaders. I had the, you know, all the service chiefs, all the nursing leadership, all the, all the other people. And I talked about the three-box solution. I gave very specific examples as we moved across, you know, the three boxes. You know, to really focus in on what's our core mission, what do we need to do to keep the engine running. 
so we can do these other things, okay? Um, I sort of go a one, three, two. I don't do a one, two, three. I sort of go a one, three, two. Because a lot of things in box two, yeah, there's some things you need to quit doing. But at my level, it's really about how do we think differently. And so I needed to go into box three to figure out how we think differently so I could replace box two. Um, I really saw them as a swap one for one, you know. Um, for instance, I, I'll use it for instance. If you read in there, there's a chapter on Hasbro, okay? And it's a toy company, right? Everybody thinks it's a toy company. It has been a toy company in the 1940s, 1950s. In the 1980s, they decided to reinvent themselves and move from being a toy company to being an entertainment company. So now they got the, term, or the uh, Transformer movies and all that other stuff, and that's really the engine now. They, that was the innovation, and it moved from three into one, and it's now the engine. So how did I change the way we think, get rid of how, get rid of how we thought two, get into three, and then move it over? And so it's really, I, I challenge you out there, what is the VA? What is our mission? What is the VHA mission? And everybody says, well, let's provide health care. Well, my very small thinking, I say that's wrong. Okay, it's provide services. Specifically, how do I keep them out of my hospital? How do I push that out to provide services? Well, I do that first of all in some things that we, not healthcare at all, homelessness, employment services, all those things increase your, the, the chances that you're gonna need some kind of healthcare because this, your environment is wrong. So we focus in on those things, so we provide services. Those aren't healthcare at all. It has a huge impact. But while I'm pushing these things out, and telemedicine, big believer, telehealth, huge. Push it out. That helps me solve a box one problem that is just killing me, and that's parking. Think about that. <laughs> no, Anybody seriously. Anybody else with parking problems? <laughs> so, so, so I could either, I can build another parking garage capacity, or I can push services out where they don't come to me, demand. Let's go after the demand. You know, it's, it's actually easier to go after the demand than it is to get $10 million for another parking garage. So it's kind of those things as we put it together. Let's look at, and telehealth and telemedicine helps with that, with taking us out of the brick and mortar mentality. You know, let's, it's not within these walls. And you just push it out. Again, I'm so focused on parking, it's not funny. That's my number one thing. <laughs> and, and it's the number one complaint I get, believe it or not. It's not health care. It's, it's, followed closely by the telephone system. Anybody else have that problem? <laughs> um, and so it, it just helps reinvent us and how we think. I'm, I'm gonna throw the, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna touch the third rail, okay? Let's talk about service lines, okay? Touch that third rail. There's a lot of people who have, have their own cheese and don't want you to steal their cheese. But we gotta rethink how this service or this Department of Surgery, for instance, you know, in mine and most of yours, providers are underneath the chief, the nurses are underneath the, uh, underneath the nurse exec, the MSAs at the front desk are underneath the business office, under the AD. I've got nobody when something goes wrong go, hey, you, what went on there, you fix it. Let's look at our C-Box the same way. You know, our C-Box, I've got my biggest C-Box, I have to find out what service they belong to first before I can address uh, the problem. So let's reimagine how we organize ourselves. Maybe that's incremental, but I think it's pretty, for the VA, uh, I've, I've pushed a little bit at this and I've gotten quite a bit of pushback, you know? So I don't know if it's incremental or if it's revolutionary. It's not, certainly not revolutionary because others are doing it. So it's kind of the things, you gave me that construct that I can explain that to people and they get it. I think that one of the um, greatest assets that the three box solution really provides us with is a simple vocabulary. It's easy to grasp at any level of the enterprise. But I'm curious, so VG, VG's wife, Kirthy, actually worked for the VA, um, what was it, DSS implementation back, back in the day. So VG has um, some ties to our community. I think anybody um, within the, the United States certainly does as well. So could you just give us a, a what, what could the VA's future look like as we scale three box solution enterprise wide if everybody within VA understood this this structure, um, whether or not if they participated as a box three thinker, or if they were purely saying, you know what, box one operations, that's where I exist, that's where I'm comfortable, and that's, that's perfectly fine, by the way. We need box one um, uh, executors. So what, what, what could VA's future look like? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for uh, 
your remarks. I uh, really appreciate that. I think the Three Box Solution book provides a very simple frame. And the simplicity of that frame is what allows you to think creatively. Sometimes you need a simple frame to structure your thinking. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. And I would agree with you. There are innovations we need to do inside box one. So box one is not a bad thing. And we need to continue to innovate in box one, which is more incremental in nature, more supporting what we currently do. But we also simultaneously need to do these step innovations, the breakthrough innovations, the transformational innovations. And I think the potential for VA hospital is humongous because I find, frankly, the waste and inefficiency in US healthcare is just humongous. It's just incredible. And that includes VA as well. And take, for instance, these are simple examples. There is a device called steel clamp. This is a device that you use to hold the heart in place when you do an open heart surgery. When you do an open heart surgery, you've got to keep the heart in place. And you use something called a steel clamp, which costs $160. In this country, after every surgery, that steel clamp is thrown away. There are hospitals in India which reuse that steel clamp 100 times. Of course, using sterilization and so on and so forth. If you use a steel clamp once in your surgery, the cost of the steel clamp for open heart surgery is $160. If you reuse it 100 times, the cost of steel clamp for open heart surgery is $1.60. And the Joint Commission International, JCI, allows reuse of such medical devices. This is a simple, classic example of how US hospitals are so inefficient, so wasteful. They throw the steel clamp away because it is drenched in blood. Sure, you can sterilize and reuse it. You don't throw scissors away after each surgery. You don't throw forceps away after each su surgery. Why do you throw this medical device away? <coughs> Similarly, take chronic cases. Chronic cases, which are typically what happens for patients 60 years and older. Chronic cases are treated in the most expensive infrastructure in the US, which is the hospital infrastructure. You keep a patient, a chronic patient, either because of diabetes or heart condition or whatever, for 30 days in the hospital, you bankrupt the system. And in, there are examples of hospitals in India where chronic cases are treated at home. You only come to the hospital when it is needed. In fact, most of these patients would rather prefer to be at home. The care is more kind and done by family members. We overutilize the most expensive infrastructure. That's why the costs are going through the roof. So I think we can find, let me give you a very quick example. There is a hospital in India which does open heart surgery for $2,000. Open heart surgery in the US will cost $150,000. Because in this hospital, open heart surgery costs 75 times less. That doesn't mean their quality is 75 times inferior. I don't even know how you can do poor quality heart surgery. <laughs> One measure of quality in a heart surgery is mortality rates 30 days after surgery. For this hospital in Bangalore, India, their mortality rates 30 days after surgery is 1.2%. The US average is 2%. So their quality is on par, even better. We have got to go out and look for such examples where they provide world-class quality at an ultra-low cost and embrace those breakthrough healthcare delivery innovations in here. I see potential for VA humongous. I agree. Um, so Fiji uh, touched upon the idea of weak signals, which is one of my personal um, favorite uh, frameworks from from the book uh, and in itself. And uh, Mr. Dunning, I'm kind of curious what what specifics uh, really resonated with you in this platform. I, again, it was just mm -hmm. the e the I could envision the three boxes mm -hmm. and I could explain it. Yeah. A lot of times you read these books, you read it and you have to use their words to explain it. Mm -hmm. I could use mine. 
and I could use my, um, you know, my experiences. But, but one of the things, and it's not in the book, but you saw it, it resonates across a couple of the stories is, um, and I'm going to use my own words again, get out of the echo chamber, okay? Because we, as we do innovation, we all have grown up in the same world for the most part. And uh, yesterday they had the, the panel up here and they were talking to the second panel and the, the young lady at the end there talked about the, the barriers. And one of the barriers was we've always done it this way. Mm -hmm. The worst one is we tried that before and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, but if you get out of that echo chamber and do things like what we've done in Memphis is uh, we, we've joined you know, George Hacks in the hackathon. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and we send them our questions. Dr. Sandal took it out to San Francisco a couple of weeks ago. And we ask a question about rural health. We have a high um, no-show rate. And then when we dig, the no-show rate is because they don't have the transportation to get there. Well, one of the things we're going back to the Innovator Network is maybe an Uber, where we work that till we get them there. Or we go to, like, we just had the startup of the year in Memphis. We're all across Memphis. So you got to get out of that echo chamber and get somebody else's ideas, because just because you're in health, a healthcare expert doesn't mean you've got the answers, because you built your own box around you. Um, and that's what you got to do. And it echoed through a, a GE did that. I mean, it was one of they got out of there. They had somebody had nothing to do with what the, what they were doing, you know, as the light bulb company. And they moved on toward medical devices. They had somebody come in that was not from their core business. They got out of the echo chamber. Yeah, I think that is beautiful. Um, <clears throat> so. My last question for both of you is, we have our audience members here, and just show of hands, who's read the book? Who's familiar with it? All my innovation specialists, absolutely. So we've got, we've got some significant opportunity here, and I want everyone within VA to know that you can access um, the three-box solution on TMS Skillsoft. You can download it as an audio book. I'm being told to stop right now. Um, but one last question. So after everybody reads the three-box solution, what is your one piece of advice for them to start operationalizing it within their work units? By the way, uh, I flashed my email address if, as you are implementing Treebox Solution. Any questions you have, any things you want me to comment on, please send me an email. I he will to... respond within 30 seconds. Yeah. I'd, <laughs> I'd love, love to see the impact. Uh, I'm ultimately interested in impact. Uh, by the way, maybe let me close with, with a more personal call. This Treebox Solution is not just for VA hospital. This is also something you can use to drive your own personal strategy. Uh, everyone in this room, you got to prepare a strategy architecture, not for VA hospital, for you. A one-page strategy architecture for yourself. What's your moon statement? What are the weak signals you're going to amplify? What are the hypotheses you're going to test? What are the competencies you're going to build? It's very important for each and every one of you to take a look at your calendar every day and ask the question, did I spend enough time in box one today? Did I spend enough time in box two today? Did I spend enough time in box three today? Mm -hmm. For everyone in this room, future is now. By the way, today you have put your box one on hold, isn't it? And that's why you're here. And, and saying, you know, here are these speakers and see whether we can get some good ideas. Don't go back to work tomorrow and just go 100% back in box one. This is not a project accomplished or a mission accomplished because future comes in daily doses. Old age doesn't come one at a, one, all at once. Old age comes one day at a time. Future comes one day at a time. Let's understand that, let's recognize that, and let's practice three box solution for your own personal leadership journey. That's the message I want to leave with. Beautiful. I think we'll end it at that. Thank you so much, gentlemen. It's been a true pleasure. Thank you, sir. Just a, a few housekeeping uh, items before we take a break. So this afternoon, there's a, a change in the agenda. The demos will be in the Holman Lounge and in the ballroom, not in the First Amendment Lounge. And just some, some other updates for you all. If you don't have the app, there's an app called Attendify. There's going to be live voting that occurs throughout today and tomorrow. Uh, and there will actually be awards based upon that live voting. Not to make any of the presenters more nervous for what's coming up, uh, but this is being live streamed across the country. I'm told they have close to six, 7,000 streams right now, so that will probably grow throughout the day. 
Uh, so just be on your best behavior for those presenting. Um, and then uh, just an item tomorrow morning, the exhibit hall opens at 8 a.m. They are expecting a lot of people to be here, so we're just telling people to plan on getting here around 8 a.m. You'll see demos occurring, and please take some time, visit our partner tables. All the individuals out there are, are doing work with VA today. So some of the things you're going to see today and some of the exhibits tomorrow, these are actual innovations. These are industry partners who are committed to our mission. They're doing work with us. So take a, a chance, stop by, see some of the work going on. Uh, we'll try to be back in about 10 minutes to start IEX Talks. Thank you.
bells are ringing outside. Time to get started. Take a seat. Ooh, that's a good hush. You can just start to make your way in, folks. Have a seat. Thank you so much. Give another minute or so here for folks to have a seat. How are we doing? Good? Feeling energized? Feeling ready to rock? All right. My name is Allison Emrine, and I am the Director of Operations for the VHA Innovators Network, proud partner of Bryn Cole here, who you met earlier. And you just experienced part of our training. So part of our mission, the Innovators Network mission, is to train employees and VHA about innovation-related competencies, to kind of train our innovation army, our way of thinking, uh, to change how we look at problems, design solutions. So the three-box solution is a huge part of our, um, our competencies that we're delivering across VA. And now, you're gonna get to experience our, one of our second missions, empowering employees. So for these IEX talks, you are going to hear from some tremendous box three innovators. Um, and part of our mission is to support them. And I'm very, very, very proud to do so. Um, they are the reason that I get up every day and come to work. And before we do that, however, um, we're gonna show you a quick video a Choose VA video, 30 seconds, promise it will be painless. And I can tell you right now, veterans might not even notice. They might not realize, but they're choosing VA because of VA innovation, because of VA innovative qualities and innovative employees. So we'll get started with the video, and then we will welcome our first IEX talk. Thank you all. I choose VA because giving back to veterans is the most important thing that we can do. I choose VA because I want to serve the veterans that served us. I choose the VA because they make me feel important. I choose the VA because the VA cares. I choose VA because they've saved my life. I choose the VA because it's the best thing that happened to me. Choose VA today. For more information, visit va.gov. Good morning, everyone. Hi, my name is Beth Ripley, and I'm here to tell you some stories today. And you might think that I'm here to tell you about this, this 3D printer, this technology. And you might think that the stories I'm going to tell you today are about the technology of 3D printing. Nope. The real reason I'm here today is to tell you the stories of the people who use the technology to take care of veterans in new, creative, innovative ways. So I am here today to tell the stories of the VA 3D Printing Innovators Network, many of which are in this audience. If you're part of that network, raise your hand. Woohoo! look at all these people, and it's growing. And all of these people, and maybe you, when we're done, are going to join together to try to take care of patients in a way that's whole. Because in the end, our goal is to make our patients feel seen, heard, and whole. So the first story I want to tell you is about how this technology can actually bring us closer together. So many technologies push us further away from our patients, you know, typing in the computer when you could be making eye contact, you know, we're all guilty of looking at our phones when we could be looking at a person. But this technology has a way of bringing people closer together. And so the first story is about communication and connection. So this is veteran Greg Marshall. 
He found out recently that he had a tumor of the kidney. He found out a second thing at that time, though, which is that he only has one kidney. Now, almost all of us have two kidneys. He only had one kidney, and it fused together when he was born. And that caused some additional uh, challenges because all the vasculature, the vessels, the blood vessels that feed that kidney were a little bit different. So his surgeon, Dr. Porter, needed to remove that tumor, preserve as much of that single kidney as possible, and avoid any complications with all of those blood vessels. So he sat down with veteran Marshall, and he did what all the good doctors do, right? We talk a lot. We probably draw some cute pictures you know, on something. And he even went further. He pulled up on his computer veteran Marshall's imaging, his CT scan, and he scanned through all of it. And he's saying, you know, OK, here's, the, here's your kidney here. Here's the tumor here. Um, thousands of black and white images are going, right? Um, by the way, I'm a, I'm a radiologist, and I spent uh, 20 years of schooling to figure out how to read those things. But you know, we're showing it to the patient. And the patient looks at it and says, oh, really? That's what it is? Because all I see is a bunch of black and white gobbledygook. All right? So Dr. Porter thought, you know what? There's got to be a better way. And so he 3D printed that kidney. He took it from the CT scan, two dimensions, black and white, brought it into reality into three dimensions with 3D printing. And then they were able to sit down, have a conversation together, and make sure that Mr. Marshall really understood what was going on. He was able to ask questions. He was empowered. And he was ready to go into surgery once he knew what he was up against. And by the way, the, the model went with him to the operating room. So this is Dr. Porter operating here. Um, and the communication and connection continued with this model because then the team, the t entire care team, used it to make sure that they were all on the same page and they knew what they were doing and they had a unified vision and plan. And it was an excellent result. The tumor was removed entirely, the kidney was spared, and everything is going well. Story number two is about personalization. So often we're forced to fit into what society gives us right? Small, medium, large, you know, just make the best of it. Sometimes that's not good enough. And one of my favorite people who's in the audience here, Mary Matthews Brownell, she's a hand therapist who said, that's not good enough for my patients. I want something personalized. And here's Mary here looking through her 3D printer. And she had a patient, uh, veteran Sam Tato, and he was a victim of an IED explosive blast that damaged his elbow. And then it damaged the nerves running from the elbow up to these two fingers. And then these two fingers were permanently clutched like this. So if you do this and you look down at your hand and you think, how hard is it going to be to grab things now when you've got two fingers permanently clasped? And she used all of the tools, all of the cutting edge tools that she had available to her to try to make hand braces to help him. But this was just too strong, and so it kept cracking and breaking against that pressure. So she asked, can I use 3D printing to make something that's stronger and better? And so she worked together within the network to design a brace that could be 3D printed, reinforced, and then also fit like a glove. And here is Mr. Tato, who now can wrangle his baby girl because we all know you need, to, you need as many hands as you can when you've got a small child. The third story I want to tell you is about being proactive. We heard this, reimagine what is possible. What can we do for the patients of the future? Patients maybe we haven't even met yet. That's what these two gentlemen are doing. This is Dr. Klausman. This is Dr. Holton. Uh, together they work to help veterans that have tumors of the face, particularly the mandible. That's our jawbone. And they have to take those tumors out. And they have to replace them with something. And that means a bone. They have to take a piece of bone from somewhere else in that patient, oftentimes the leg. So two surgeries, two sets of surgeons, two wounds, can we do better? And so they said, hey, can we 3D print something? What if we can make a new bone? 
Well, we can't out of plastic, but we can with a bioprinter in the future, as we imagine. So here we have a bioprinter, and just a little plug, you could see it tomorrow, Wednesday. Um, and we started working with our close colleagues and collaborators to design a 3D printed living bone. Now, we haven't solved it yet, right? But as uh, VG told us, we think ahead. But we're getting closer. And so here's Dr. Holton just two weeks ago in Seattle. He's actually examining and feeling the first prototype of living bone that we've printed. And we're calling this project, Project Impact. And what he's doing is impacting the patients of the future. The patients he hasn't even met yet, but he's working on that. So in the end, what I hope I'm telling you is that as cool as technology is, as excited as we are about the 3D printer, in the end, it's nothing without the people around it. It's what we do with it as a network, as a community, how we re-envision how to make a mandible replace pieces of bone. And, and that's what it does. It's patient-driven, it's personalized, it's proactive, and it's what we are in VA. So thank you. All right. Hello. Is it on? Well, now I'm completely distracted, you guys, because it is, um, I'm Margaret Carrico. I am a veteran. I'm an Army-trained family physician. Happy to be at the VA. My husband just retired this year. Woo. So I'm a veteran taking care of veterans, but now I'm completely distracted by Beth's presentation because I'm a product of innovation, and this has nothing to do with my talk, but I, I just need to share it because the work that we're doing is so fantastic. So when I was in the Army, I had disease, and that's why ETS. I didn't think it was fair to not deploy and send somebody else twice. So Dr. Toby Cosgrove, who spoke here last year, I have a Cosgrove ring in my mitral valve. Let's print some uh, valve tissue. <laughs> All right, but on to blood pressure. I um, have a panel of patients. I am the primary care telehealth lead for VA Central Office, and I'm assistant chief at the Tampa VA. That seems kind of crazy, right? But we have big things to do with these virtual visits. And if I can't practice it, I can't roll it out in a facility. And if I can't roll it out in a facility, I can't roll it out across the country. So here I am. So where did we start? You know, every time you in introduce something new, I tell everybody when I go to places and do these talks, I say, let's pretend like I'm Steve Jobs. And I have the next greatest app for you. And we're all so excited, right? We don't feel bothered. We don't feel like it's the straw that broke the camel's back. We're like, yay, I get to do like whatever I get to do with Angry Birds. So let's pretend like that's this. And they all just look at me like, right, Doc? I got 200 view alerts. So where did we start? Let's think about that for perspective. That's me. Dialing, 50 years ago, I'm uh, on a rotary phone. How many people can actually remember rotary phones? Please don't let it just be me. Okay. So 70s, we get push button phones. And in the 80s, anybody remember wrapping those cords around the walls and all the paint would chip off and your mother would yell at you because you're trying to talk to like your friend in the bedroom? We moved on. We moved to um, message machines. And then we got the big cordless phones. And now we have smartphones. And everybody's probably like, this is the one presentation where I'm like, take out your phone. No, seriously, take out your phone. Take it out. And if you haven't already done it, even if you're not a veteran, just go into the app store and type in VA video. Because you'll see our app, and it'll come up. Don't buy the cupcake one at the top. Don't do that. Get the VA video app. And that's all our veterans have to do. It's that simple. So I tell my veterans, go ahead, download it. And this is why. Because in 2014, Dr. Angie Dennis Hollis, brilliant, love her, she asked me to be in this virtual pack pilot. And I was like, oh my gosh, really? Send $5,000 worth of equipment for a rash? And then in 2017, they released the PEXIP app. So it's like FaceTime. And that's what you just are hopefully downloading, the VA Video Connect. Don't check your email. And then what can we do with it? 
it's fantastic. So at the same time, they're beating on our heads, right? All the facilities want to be great on sale. They all want the, the A1C is good. They want the blood pressures controlled. And then Tampa comes up with this great idea. Anyone that touches any of my veterans, and we all know that the veterans have like maybe one appointment a year. Anyone that touches any veteran and their blood pressure is high, I get a view alert. Dr. Carrico, Mr. Smith's blood pressure was high. Really? Big surprise. So they want me all to bring all these veterans in. They want me to bring them in and do their blood pressure. But this is what they're doing, right? You guys can relate to this. This is the national capital area. I mean, even if you're from Kansas, sometimes the, they have to get through the traffic. They've got to park their car. And then they got to find me in the facility. Maybe I moved, right, because we got construction going on. And so here they are. Now they're in the clinic, and they're like this. And we're adjusting our, their blood pressures based on that. It's crazy. So with that app, I was like, well, why can't I just give them a cuff? Why can't it just be this simple? Why can't we start the paradigm shift? Why can't we start making this make sense? So I did. I started banging my head against the wall. It should count. It should count, I kept saying. And so finally, the fantastic Leonie Hayworth, who has a much more brilliant research brain than I do, said, well, this is how you do it. And I'm like, great. I'm an operational girl. I'm an army doc. I'll make it happen. So we set up sites all across the country. And we did pilot visits. And we called it a user acceptance pilot, because I don't have 13 years. I don't have that long to make this make sense. So then at the end of our pilot, we did about 300 visits. And we put we posed questions to the staff and the patients. And they loved it. They felt confident. They felt like it was reliable. They felt like it was easy. And the fascinating thing was, half my patients were over 65. Half of them were using a cell phone. And this was two years ago. So then we said, let's roll it out. It's a great idea. We need to spread it. So I applied to do the Shark Tank. So we made sure everybody had the equipment. We made sure they were all trained. They, get, they did the TMS training. We outlined clinical champions. We made templates to make it easy. And we just made a national template, which is even easier yet. You just open the template, put in the blood pressure, and as you answer all the questions, when you sign it, it populates into the vitals package. So excited for that. Um, it's the little things. So we did demos for staff, and we did virtual visits. And then the end result is the veterans were so happy. But why were they happy? Were they happy because I controlled their blood pressure? They could care less. I mean, seriously, in most of them, unless they have a valve, did valve surgery like me or a heart attack, they don't care. They don't feel it. But they were happy because the ones that, maybe this was just the opening. This was, oh, I got a rash, doc. And now I've got my doctor who was kind of resistant you know, the nurse did the visit, and now we're looking at their rash. Or we're, I'm seeing the guy that his back hurts or his knee hurts, or maybe he lifted something and he's an hour and a half away, and I can see that's Popeye. He's ruptured that biceps tendon. So it's just a way to get started. And then what happened? Just the few facilities where we really pushed these visits, they went through the roof. And why they went through the roof was because in May of 2018, we got the quality people to say that these blood pressures could count for HEDIS. So if we can make them count, it's really worth something. So what did I learn? Change is hard. So again, Steve Jobs and a turtleneck, just picture that. Really cool app. Bring in the schedulers early, right? That's super important. If you want to get something done, get the front, you know, the front line staff. Get the nurses involved. Get the front line physicians and the packed teams to do it, and it will happen. And then the tech solutions. We don't have all data sit on the, I mean, we've all like been on the line for two hours. We don't. So we have fantastic help desk that pick up in under 30 seconds to help these people. I'm not saying it all goes perfectly, but most of them go just right. And then positive marketing to patients. That's my job. That's what I do. And we just try to spread the good news. So what's coming? It's a great tool, and it's a great place to start. But what's coming in the next year or so is the VA is working with a company that can now Bluetooth. So you see the vitals during the visit. So if I can issue a blood pressure cuff where the patient doesn't even have to show me what the blood pressure is, you know, I can see them. I've issued the cuff within the last year. He can turn it around, and I can see that he's not faking it, and he's not laying on the bed with his feet up trying to make it better. But then if it can Bluetooth, that would be even better yet. So 
when you think about all of these, the scales, the pulse ox, even that single lead EKG, what if I got a guy that's getting readmitted all the time and now I can just say, hey, he's like, I feel short of breath and my heart's palpitating. Can I see if he's back in AFib? This is exciting. But what's more exciting to me is to think about that rotary phone. So I get blown away when I think 50 years ago, my mom thought it was a cute picture to take me, a picture of me with a rotary phone. And now I look at these doctors that are coming out, and even my kid, who won't even call me, he will not call, he FaceTimes me. Somebody said it yesterday, but it's the truth. He's in his bedroom and he's FaceTiming me on the couch. So we've got to grasp this technology for our patients, and these virtual blood pressure visits are a great place to start. Thanks. Good morning. I'm Shane Elliott, and I'm the Associate Director for the Loma Linda VA Medical Center. And I'm also the team lead for VA's nationwide text message appointment reminder system called VetText. And today I'm going to talk to you about open slot management. But first, if you'll notice on the bottom of the slide and all the rest of the slides, there's a code and a number. If you send that code to the number, text it, you can experience what the veterans experience when they interact with open slot management. So you can do that now or do it later. The number will work. You can take this home with you and share it with other staff if you want to show them what open slot management is about. 1,600 years. If I told you I could save veterans a cumulative amount of wait time of 1,600 years, would you be interested in finding out how? <laughs> Raise your hand. All right, let's figure it out. So, open slot management is the latest innovation brought to you by the VetTex team. It harnesses the power of a text message, and with that power, we're transforming the way VA schedules. Now, like VetTex, open slot management is already deployed nationwide, but even though it's deployed nationwide, we still need your help. So, what is open slot management? Well, before I do that, I want to introduce you to one of our veterans at Loma Linda. This is Mike. Meet Mike. And that's uh, his daughter. So Mike's a Vietnam Navy veteran. He served on the USS Forrestal. He survived the fires of the USS Forrestal along with John McCain. When he describes this day, it was a terrifying battle to save both the crew and the ship. Hearing stories like Mike's is a constant reminder to me about why I work for the VA and also why I innovate to try to improve the way we care for our veterans. So Mike, a couple months ago, Mike was in the eye clinic for an appointment, a follow-up to a surgery, and his doctor told him she wanted to see him in six months to measure his eye pressures and see how he was doing. So Mike thanked the doctor and left, and he went and saw the scheduler. So when he got to the scheduler, the scheduler apologized and said, gosh, I'm sorry, the best I can do for you is get you in two months after when the doctor wanted to see you. So Mike took that appointment and left. Then, over the next month, he shared with both his wife and family his concerns. Well, what if my eye pressure gets worse? Is my doctor going to know that? If I'm there two months later, is that too long? Should I call and try to get another appointment? Should I try to secure a message my doctor? Maybe I should call the patient advocate and ask them. Just then, Mike got a message, a text message, from the VA, powered by open slot management. This message told him that he had a new appointment, or we could provide him a new appointment, and it was just days after when his doctor wanted to see him. So Mike responded with the right code. Open slot management made the new appointment and confirmed him ba back with a new message, let him know that he had a new appointment. So Mike was now relieved. Now he could get his eye pressures measured when his doctor wanted to see them, and he didn't have to worry anymore. So Mike is a perfect example of the power of open slot management. So when we started with VetText, our goal was to send appointment reminders to veterans and remind them to come to their appointments. Our goal was to decrease no-show rates. Well, we found out we did decrease no-show no rates, but it wasn't by getting veterans to come to their appointments. 
What we're actually doing is making it easier for veterans to cancel their appointment by text message when they couldn't make it. But that's okay. We want to know that. We want to know when they can't come because then we can reuse that appointment for another veteran. And that's where open slot management comes in. When a veteran cancels their appointment, open slot management's algorithm determines who the patient waiting the longest is that qualifies for that appointment and then offers that appointment to them by text message. Now, in the last six months, we have rescheduled over 18,000 appointments. We have saved, on average, 40 days per veteran. So if you add that up, it's 1,600 years of wait time that we've saved. So remember when I said I needed your help. So when we started with open slot management, we focused on primary care. And if you're in the healthcare profession, you know that the most impacted clinics are specialty care. So if you work at a VA hospital, do me a favor, go back, find your group practice manager, find your vet techs administrator, and find out if open slot management is an enable for specialty care. And if it isn't, please help, please work with them to enable it, to make open slot management have the biggest impact it possibly can. Now before I leave, one last thing. Mike is actually my dad. I am proud that my dad served our country, and I'm proud that he gets his care at my hospital. My dad growing up taught me there was nothing I couldn't do myself, and I could always improve on a process. So Mike is one of the reasons I worked at the VA, and Mike is the reason why I innovate. Thank you. Hello, good morning. My name is Kathy Hertz, and I'm an oncology clinical nurse specialist at Heinz VA Hospital, which is near Chicago. Today, I would like to share with you Mark's story. Meet Mark. He's a 63-year-old man who is recently retired, and he usually comes to our VA with his wife. He unfortunately was recently diagnosed with colon cancer. M Mark will meet our team. The picture below shows Dr. Brian Johnson, his oncologist, Prachi Patel, who's the oncology pharmacist, and then our amazing team of outpatient infusion chemo nurses. He finds out he's going to be with us in his newly found freedom in retirement every two weeks for intravenous chemotherapy. He's going to get to know the team, and they're going to support him and make sure he adheres to his regimen. About two years goes by, and unfortunately, Mark cancer progresses, and the IV treatment, intravenous treatment, will not be is effective, it's found to not be effective. So he's going to have to start an oral treatment plan or oral anti-cancer drugs. He's going to have to manage that medication at home. He's going to have to manage a complex dosing schedule and follow many special instructions. What if I told you here today that there's a tool for Mark that's interactive, practical for use, and would provide clear communication so he could adhere to that medication regimen at home? Can I get a show of hands of those here today who would be interested in a tool like that? Thank you. So this is something that I've been creating for my patients when I was a clinic nurse back in 2005, and now it's Prachi Patel, our oncology pharmacist, and our treatment nurses who work to create these calendars. There's basically four steps we typically take. One, we really want to drive home the dates and the times that they're going to need to take their medication. Uh, two, what I should have said first, is the name of the medication. And then three, there's special dosing instructions. So at the bottom of the screen, it says that he's going to need to take two tablets that are 500 milligrams with each dose and one tablet that's 150 milligrams with each dose. So you can tell that it's complex specifically for this medication. And then we go over number four uh, dietary guidelines that he's going to have to take it within 30 minutes of a meal. It's Think about it, it's a calendar. It's something many of us use every day. It's interactive. We ask him to draw a line through the name of the medication when he takes, the, takes it so that he's sure to adhere to the plan. And it provides him communication at his fingertips, so uh, maximizes key points, key communication. The catch here is that it takes about 20 to 30 minutes for me or one of us to create one of these calendars. 
And that's time we could have been really spending with Mark and his wife. So what I've really always wanted to create is a software program, I call it My Chemo Calendar, where you would, one, choose the cancer type, two, choose the drug regimen, three, choose the start date, and then four, boom, the calendar is populated, you print it, and you can go in and spend that time with Mark and his wife. It's practical for use, uh, it's, it still is practical, it's still, can be interactive, he'll have that calendar that he can draw a line through the name of the drug when he takes the medication at home. And it still will provide a maximum communication. Uh, the thing here is that it would save plenty of time. It would probably be created in less than one minute and would save us so much time. So I've talked this idea over with many people and it was Dr. Abigail Silva, our health research scientist, that, said, that shares my passion for oral adherence and she encouraged me to apply for a Spark Award through the Innovation Network. So the idea was accepted, but it was not funded, and this left us very confused and did not really know where to turn next. It was the first week of training through the boot camp, through the Innovation Network, that we learned many key concepts about engaging key stakeholders and about um, concepts of human-centered design. So what we really took away from that is that we shouldn't be coming up with our own solutions to the adherence problem. We should be listen, listening to the whole team. So what we came up with, can you still hear me? Okay. What we came up with after listening to our key stakeholders of veterans who are on these oral anti-cancer drugs and then our oncology physicians, nurses, pharmacists, is that we want to move forward with trying to really uh, get a solid tool for our patients. So what we have here is our simplified dosing guide. It still could be ready to be used in under one minute, and it's still practical for use, can be interactive, and uh, allows for key communication. This is something that we can create for each complex regimen, grab it while we're in clinic, and go over it with patients at, each, at the visit when they're starting this medication or visits throughout while they're on the medication. Um, so what we're going to do with this tool is we're going to measure adherence while patients are on our current tools, and then we're going to compare it against uh, adherence while they're on these simplified tools. Uh, so what we hope to, to show with this project is that uh, is changes in what we learned in our questionnaires. So we asked our oncology physicians, nurses, and pharmacists in general, how confident are you that your patients are learning all necessary instructions in order to take these medications effectively? Only 6% feel most confident that our patients are leaving with all that necessary information. So we feel that we will be seeing changes in measures like this. So we're excited to start our quality improvement project. Imagine how the future could look in the near future if we had an app available where Mark could access the whole treatment plan or his wife or his family member could have that on their smartphone on an app. And imagine that they're getting reminders sent to them with key dosing instructions and key information so that they can be sure to adhere the plan so Mark can be focused on what's really more important to him. Thank you so much and please feel free to reach out to me about simplified dosing guides and oral adherence. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Daniel Abrahamson. Nice to meet you guys. It's Hi. a good looking audience out there. <laughs> Eli Kaufman, yes, that is me over there. I know, he's everywhere. <laughs> Danny and I are VA prosthetists. So uh, what we're here to talk to you about this morning is not really providing mobile care. It's more of fulfilling Lincoln's promise to care for him who shall have borne the battle. And what I feel like is really important about that statement is that it's all inclusive. It doesn't leave anybody out. It's not just those who can fight the traffic and make it into your VA center. It's really about caring for all people. So what Eli and I noticed was that we weren't doing a great job of that. We had people who were falling through the cracks. They'd come into our clinic and they would start the process of receiving a prosthesis, but they really wouldn't be able to follow through. Uh, let me tell you about Matt. You saw him on the video. Right, Matt's an impressive guy, he's big. When I first met him, I was a little intimidated, I'm a 6'2". He's strong and he's capable. 
And you would think he would be able to make it into his appointments. I mean, this guy like cares for his three kids as a stay-at-home dad, which we all know is like an impossible task. And uh, he's also started his own nonprofit organization to help wounded warriors recover. So what was it that made it hard for Matt to come in? Well, that bullet that took Matt's leg when he was 21 in Iraq also took his confidence. It made him have to create this safety bubble that he rarely ventured out of. And when Matt got into the car to make that two and a half hour drive to the VA, his anxiety went up. And then when Matt got stuck in traffic, it really reminded him of bad things that happened to him when he was in Iraq. It was tough for him. So he couldn't make it. He couldn't make it in. Eli's going to tell us about another guy. You bet. So Another patient we work with, his name is Mark. So Mark fought in Vietnam, came home from that war with serious mental health problems, depression, anxiety, uh, thoughts of suicide, a persistent and very profound sense of self-worthlessness. Um, he trained as a watchmaker. He went to Europe, went to one of the finest trade schools there to learn the trade, came back home, but he couldn't manage to keep his employment due to his mental health problems. Uh, he's now homeless. He lives out of the cab of his pickup truck, which he keeps uh, at a park in the north end of Seattle. And he lost his leg below the knee to diabetes in 2014. Now he's been falling through the cracks because he'll only come to the VA for pretty much emergency care and that's about it. Um, now you see, for Mark, um, although he's in no trouble with the law at all, his mental state is such that he's convinced that if he comes into our facility, our police are going to detain him, they'll lock him up in the basement, and he just may never be seen again. Now, Matt and Mark have very different stories, but they do share some interesting things in common. One is that they've gone <clears throat> months, sometimes years, with a poorly fitting or even a broken prosthesis due to their challenges to come in. We also know about them both that they've tried VA's current alternative for veterans like themselves, which is we'll send them to our community care providers. And for a variety of reasons, um, they have been unsuccessful in working with community providers to get their pro pros prosthetic needs met. Um, now, although they bo both walk with the prosthesis, um, what mobility means for each of them is really quite different and it's pretty profound. For Matt, uh, mobility means that he can go hunting and go on fishing expeditions with his family and friends and fellow wounded warriors, very important to his life. It means also, though, that he doesn't have to worry about getting a wound on his leg just from taking his kids on a hike. And he doesn't have to worry about his leg falling off while he's crossing the parking lot to the grocery store. Mark, on the other hand, needs mobility for him means that he can get to the food bank. He can access the resources that he needs in the city. Maybe more importantly, it means that he can get out into the community, hang out with his friends in the park. He's not going to be cloistered inside his pickup truck for days and weeks on end where he inevitably his mental and physical well-being tend to deteriorate. So our solution was easy. We knew what we had to do. We knew we had to go out to these veterans. We just didn't know how we were going to do it. So Eli and I spent a fair bit of time thinking about this because we're used to having access to specialized tools, a full shop, where we move back and forth in our patient visits and we modify a prosthesis and tweak it to fit them so that they can regain their mobility. So how was it that we were going to take that toolkit with us on the road and still be successful in providing world-class care? So what we had to do is we had to move outside of our industry. We had to look for tools that were typically used in the construction industry. We had to really think outside of the box. Um, I can't believe I just said the box again. <laughs> and um, we, we grabbed other tools like secure video conferencing when we had to pull other team members in with us along the way. And um, we also acquired a handheld scanner so that we could digitally capture limb shapes rather than using traditional methods. So uh, we've been collecting data as we go, and just to touch on some of our outcomes, mobility, we've seen improvements across the board with our patients. Not too big a surprise, we're providing prosthetics for individuals with amputations, so nothing too surprising there. Um, a lot of travel burden saved, over 4,500 miles this year. Uh, just to talk about one patient I worked with recently, he told me prior to, to mobile ops service, uh, 
he, he doesn't drive, but his wife does, but she's very uncomfortable driving in the city. So she would drive him halfway, uh, half of the 150 miles to the VA. They would stay in the motel for the night, and then the adult daughter would come the next morning, pick him up, and bring him the rest of the way. So this is the kind of stress that we were able to alleviate in this gentleman's life. Really awesome. And then if we look at our cost data, um, now, it, intuitively, we would think to provide this type of amazing veteran-centered uh, service, we'd probably be spending so much more. In fact, this costs quite a bit less than uh, all, our alternative of sending our patients to the uh, to community care providers. So what you're looking at here is our cost savings um, compared with the same goods and services had we been sending them to community care providers during this past year. So now let me tell you a little bit about some of the unexpected benefits. When you go into somebody's home, we found that you really understand them much better. You get a better sense of what their mobility needs are. So we were actually able to provide better care. We could design the prosthesis so that it really met their needs because we saw with our own eyes what they needed. And that was powerful. The other thing is, is that it might not be surprising, but when you don't come in to get your limb taken care of, you don't come in for anything. You don't go and see the doctor for something else and then choose not to see the prosthetist. So we then became the conduit for people to access the VA system wide. They would start asking us about all sorts of things and we could plug them in with their care providers. And then people really gained a renewed faith in the VA. They felt good about the work we were doing. They really felt important. Um, once when I was working with Mark um, beside his truck, one of his friends walked by and he said, look how important I am, the VA comes to me, right? I mean, that's so cool. You know, this is a man who lives in his truck and we go and see him. Yeah. So probably just about everybody here knows somebody like Matt or Mark or one of the uh, several other people that we've worked with throughout this whole year. Maybe it's a, fa uh, a family member, maybe it's a friend. If you don't know anyone personally, almost certainly you've seen them in the halls of your facility or on the streets of your city. These are amazing people with amazing stories, but are often some of our most vulnerable patients because of the struggles that they have in coming in to see us. Um, now through Mobile Ops, the VA has been able to reach some of these patients, and it's awesome, and we want to do more. So our dream is not small, it's big. We want Mobile Ops to be in every single VA. Right? We feel like Lincoln's promise is really not being fulfilled. And I bet you you have patients who are falling through the cracks. So we need your help. We really want to diffuse this nationwide. So how are we going to do that? Well, we have some ideas. We're working through manualizing the process. But if you're a creative person, if you have access to funds, <laughs> <laughs> if you have time, and if you have energy, Take a picture of our contact information. Get in touch with us, help us. Help us make this a reality because we need you. You're a room full of innovative people. We want you to help us, so please give us a call. Thank you very much. Folks, I was told another Choose VA video was coming, but maybe it's not. Um, so we do have a very short intermission between uh, these and the next uh, IEX talks. So please come back quickly, um, get a, another cup of coffee, and come back for another set of excellent, excellent speakers. Thank you.
handful more of IEX talks. So if you all would like to have a seat, settle in. Thank you, and we will get started. Hi, I'm Suzanne Shirley. I'm the Entrepreneur in Residence Fellow uh, for the VHA Innovation Ecosystem. And I'd like to start today with a question. You know, we've been talking a lot so far today about, and last night, about imagination and reality. So what is the difference between reality and imagination? When I think about reality, I think about some of the challenges that our veterans face returning home. The chronic pain, sometimes the loss of mobility and independence, the worries that can keep them up at night, and the courage it takes to ask for help. And like many of you, I think about the realities of our healthcare system, too. I worry about the rising rate of veteran suicide. And I think about the fact that one in three veterans lives in a rural community and may have trouble accessing even the most basic healthcare. But let's change course a bit now and talk about the power of imagination. Imagine a time in the future where every VA medical center is providing world-class health care, where the limits to what we can achieve are lifted, where we begin to explore our challenges in new ways and consider solutions that have never occurred to us before. To me, this is imagining the extraordinary. So how, through innovation, can we achieve the extraordinary? As an entrepreneur in residence, it's a question that I ask myself every day. But it's more than a question. Quest. It's a journey, and one that I'd like to take you on today. But before we dive in, this journey begins with the acknowledgement that while the VA has some of the best and brightest providers in healthcare, we can't do this alone. Achieving extraordinary results begins with extraordinary people, extraordinary partners. So around this time last year, I called on MIT Georgia Tech, and George Washington University, and I asked them to help us explore some of our most complex challenges. So within a few days, I was on a plane, leaving my reality behind and entering the world of imagination. We formed strategic partnerships with these universities, and we engaged VHA innovators and program leaders and partners throughout the enterprise, in fact, many of you sitting in this room today. And we set a goal to host and facilitate VA-focused hackathons in major cities across the country. So what is a hackathon? How many of you in the audience have been to a hackathon? Yeah, I remember. We've all been there. Um, a hackathon is it's a fast-paced event. It's a design sprint where sometimes hundreds of problem solvers come together from diverse professional and academic backgrounds. They form teams to solve specific challenges over the course of usually just a few days. So those of you who have been to a hackathon know what I mean when I say that hackathons really offer us an opportunity to turn imagination into reality. Let me show you what I mean. AC with George Hacks at George Washington University, Phil, a combat veteran with a high-level spinal cord injury, took the stage and asked 300 students, if any of them would consider designing for him an arm support that would enable lateral twisting so that he could eat with a utensil on his own for the first time in 12 years. A team of driven young students came together and worked with Phil over the course of the weekend and also for months after to turn what he imagined into his new reality. A couple months later, we were in Boston at MIT with MIT Hacking Medicine, and one of our VA mental health providers took the stage and asked for help in exploring solutions that might address that sense of isolation veterans often feel when they leave the military, that sense of isolation that we know is a risk factor for suicide. Members of the industry, academic, and healthcare community came together and they designed a digital tool. It's called Match Purge. It's an app that allows veterans to build peer communities based on commonalities like age and location, or time and location of service, age, and shared experiences. 
Prescott, the entrepreneur in the middle, who's actually here today somewhere, uh, took this solution actually beyond the hackathon through Mass Challenge, one of the most prestigious accelerators. And we look forward to making this a reality in the VA through a pilot study at the Boston VA Medical Center in the coming year. A couple months later, back in DC, but this time with MIT Hacking Medicine and Samsung, we designed a solution to address uh, physician burnout. So this is a set of algorithms that takes regular biometric data that you would gather from wearing a wearable, like your number of steps, heart rate, sleep cycle, things like that. And it matches this data with behavioral inputs that the, the user can, can put in, like uh, I had a glass of wine tonight, or I had an argument with my partner, or I read a book or watched a movie. And the algorithms learn how these behaviors impact sleep. And it begins to prompt you with positive behaviors that will lead to a better night's sleep. This is becoming a reality at the Richmond VA Medical Center through a spark seed spread investment this year. At that same event, another digital solution was created, this one using geomapping and natural language processing to help veterans uh, search for, it's kind of a search engine, where you can search for certain social supports, meals, shelter, uh, urgent care. And this, the results that are generated are based on exactly where the veteran is and exactly what he or she needs. So this uh, Ernest Moy, the one in the blue there, joined us from the VA's Office of Health Equity. And now his teammates are joining him as innovation fellows to further develop their work. This solution was, to me, completely unimaginable, but to the MIT crowd, it's nothing's unimaginable. This team, led by an entrepreneur named Polly from Scotland, she's the third one in there, they designed a disruptive solution in preparation for changing FDA regulations on hearing aids. It allows us to test our own hearing and order our own hearing aids, putting the power in the hands of the patient. And I look forward to seeing how solutions like this will help the 20% of veterans that we serve who have hearing loss. So it's not just happening at hackathons now. Universities all over the country are catching wind of what we're doing, and they're contacting us. This is a student, sorry, this is a student team from Virginia Commonwealth University, three entrepreneurs that have designed a new kind of pressure bandage. And now they're working with cardiac surgeons throughout the VA to test this bandage that prevents hematomas post-cardiac surgery. So this journey is just beginning. We're hacking next in Atlanta in January with Georgia Tech, where we're going to pull together some of the most talented students from disciplines like architecture, interior design, computer science, and engineering to address challenges like how might we create a stronger, better sense of community among the veterans we serve? If you want to come to Atlanta and join me, I would love that. And there's many of you that are already planning to be there, so uh, find me after. But you know, the value in these events, it's not just about infusing our healthcare system with early stage solutions and industry innovation. It's not. It's about the community that's being developed. Because when we, the VA, take the stage and we ask for help in solving some of our most complex challenges, our toughest challenges, the response is overwhelming. We are not alone in our mission to serve veterans. Leaders from industry, academia, government, and healthcare from all over the world have joined us. These partnerships and these design challenges are and will continue to change the way we provide healthcare. This past year has been the most incredible journey of my life. Never have I been so immersed in imagination. And as this community continues in its pursuit of extraordinary innovation, I'd like to invite each and every one of you to join us in turning imagination into reality. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Lori Davis and I'm a psychiatrist researcher at the Tuscaloosa VA Medical Center. Um, I'd like to tell you about two exciting innovations. 
The first is uh, Individual Placement and Support, IPS. It's not so new, it's been around for 20 years or so. Individual Placement and Support, IPS, is where an employment specialist helps a person living with a disability get back into meaningful competitive employment. Our innovation is that for the past decade, we've shown that it's extremely uh, effective for veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder. Because in VA, IPS is usually typically reserved for veterans with serious psychotic disorder. So that brings me to our second innovation. We're expanding IPS for veterans with PTSD through the first ever VA Pay for Success Social Impact Bond. It's a way of uh, using private capital to pay for upfront costs and, and de-risk the government. But before we get into details, let me tell you what the veterans who are with PTSD who are getting back to meaningful work are saying. Work is my therapy. Work gives purpose and meaning. Work is my recovery. You see, for people living with a disability, work is not just a means to an income but it's a means to a better sense of identity, a renewed sense of promise and hope for the future, for themselves and their families. So what is it like? What does it feel like to have post-traumatic stress disorder? Well, imagine yourself with a gun held to your head. And we might all feel like this on one day or another when we're under a pressing deadline. That's why they call it deadline. But for a veteran with, living with post-traumatic stress disorder, living in the fear under the threat of death is a common experience. People with post-traumatic stress have nightmares, sleep to, uh, problems. They're overreactive, hypervigilant. But at the core of post-traumatic stress is avoidance and isolation. People are avoiding going out in public. They don't want to get triggered for these memories and emotional problems. So they avoid going out looking for a job. If they get a job, they avoid going to work. They avoid their coworkers. Imagine that a conversation feels like a confrontation, making it difficult to sustain employment. So let me tell you, let me share a story with you about George. He's a Marine. He spent 14 years in the Marines. He's still a Marine, a veteran. They always say I'm a Marine. <laughs> um, he was deployed to Iraq three times. He came back to civilian life, not so well, struggling with PTSD, bouncing from job to job, living in fear, his relationships fell apart because of his PTSD symptoms as well as his shame of unemployment. And he started working with one of our IPS specialists who really picked up on his passion for people despite his avoidance and matched him to a business. So he's now working as an HR recruiter in a large business. He says, the IPS specialist cares about you. They want to see you succeed. Life doesn't stop after the military. There's a lot you have to offer society. Individual placement and support is person-centered, meaning it's individualized, custom-made. It's a rapid job search, skipping over pre-vocational training and set-aside sheltered sheltered work to go into the community. It's like a real estate deal. They've overcome their ambivalence just enough to uh, work with you, so let's go. Let's go into the community. But it's integrated in the treatment team. I think of this as a behavioral intervention, hand in hand with the therapist, with the psychiatrist providing the medicine, to go into public settings and overcome avoidance find new ways to cope with challenges. And it's open-ended. 
This is not a one and done. Get a job and call it a day. It's about helping the veteran over time, even after that job is obtained, to sustain employment and call it success. We conducted a VA 12-site cooperative study comparing IPS to the usual care vocational model in the VA. Many of you are familiar with this. Transitional work, where they go into a set-aside job for minimum wage, working in laundry, filing, uh, grounds maintenance, for four to six months before they go out into the community. We showed that IPS was twice as likely to help that veteran become a steady worker compared to transitional work. Even when we controlled for that set-aside job, they worked more days, earned more income, had uh, more full-time work. People like George, they found a job, but also their PTSD symptoms got better. Work does not make the PTSD, by and large, worse. Now that they have a job, better, better sense of pride, they were able to reconnect with family, friends, and on our measures, their personal relationships got better, quality of life improved, and satisfaction with their community. So how do we find the resources to, um, buy the, uh, to pay for these intensive, high-impact services? Well, several years ago, an organization called Social Finance called me, cold called me, and said, Dr. Davis, we're interested in setting up a pay-for-success social impact bond in the VA space. I thought this was a prank. <laughs> but they were legit. They had set up several successful projects in Europe, and this was just getting started in the United States. So how does a pay-for-success social impact bond work? Fast forward to 2017, socially concerned investors, basically rich people, put up $5.1 million, and this social impact bond sold out in two weeks. To pay for the services, we provide the service, the IPS, for over 480 veterans with PTSD. We're one year into it. At large VA medical centers, we're operating in New York Harbor, VA Boston, Central Western Massachusetts. And based on predefined outcomes, the VA and the non-federal partners, the VA made us find matching partners, so we had to go out and find, we got City of New York, City of Boston, Commonwealth of Massachusetts to match up with the VA and based on predefined outcomes, will pay back the investors their money plus some return on their investment. Think about it. It's better for the government to pay a premium for something that works rather than something that doesn't. And the investors are the ones at risk, but they're incentivized to pay for a program that will work. But let's not get starry-eyed thinking about money. Let's go back to George, the veteran who's helped rebuild his life and his family and community, where work is my therapy, work gives me purpose and meaning, and work is my recovery. So, call to action. We want more IPS for PTSD in the VA. So if you're a provider, if you're a director, if you're a veteran and you want to see more IPS expanded in VAs, give me a call or an email. If you know a rich person, have a rich uncle. <laughs> if you're on a board of directors for a, a foundation, let's talk together with social finance to come on board for this Pay for Success project which is really going to hit headlines very soon because we made our first benchmark this year. will be the first time VA and our non-federal partners paying back investors for a high-impact uh, rehabilitation program. Thank you.
Uh, my name is Elizabeth Oliva, and today I'm going to talk to you about VA opioid overdose education and naloxone distribution. So before I get started, just a show of hands, how many of you have heard the term naloxone? Um, <laughs> wow. Okay. It's also known as Narcan, but vast majority of you have. So today, we're going to engage in a little bit of a mental exercise. I'm going to take you on a time machine, not that far uh, ago, uh, seven years ago, let's just that's how far back our time machine's gonna go. If I were to have asked that question seven years ago, I doubt many of you would have raised your hands, unless you're actual medical professionals where you actually use a naloxone. Um, but in general, it was not in the press as much as it was. There was no Surgeon General advisory. There wasn't even an op opioid epidemic really identified seven years ago. We were starting to see that. But it wasn't really much on anybody's radar. Um, the AMA had not come out and had a task force that recommended naloxone. And so why am I even bothering talking to you about this? So from 2000 to 2014, nearly half a million Americans died from drug overdoses. This is more than the number of Americans killed in World War I, the Korean War, and the Vietnam Wars combined. And we know that among drug overdoses, opioid overdoses are the most common form. And just recent data just came out that we lose in our system three VHA patients per day from opioid overdose. And just this year, and it's, this epidemic hasn't stopped, just this year opioid overdoses alone surpassed motor vehicle accidents as uh, one of the leading causes of accidental deaths. So more people die of opioid overdose than die of motor vehicle accidents. This is how, this is the state of affairs we are in MBA. So, if there's anything I want you to leave with today, it's that we know that opioid overdose death is preventable. And that's why you guys have heard about naloxone. This is why those hands went up, is because we know we have an intervention that works. And it's been around for 30 years, right? And so we're in our time machine. We're going to go back to 2012. Eliza Wheeler and her colleagues um, looked at community-based programs. So these are programs that serve not treatment-seeking individuals. These are injection. Uh, persons who inject drugs, n still using, actively using, and they found out of 53,000 people who they gave naloxone to, they had 10,000 reversals reported, okay? And these were not, back then, remember, we're in our time machine, these programs had to assemble these kits that they, they basically had to take an FDA-approved uh, product and figure out how to get it to laypersons, and so look at these kits. These are what they assembled. Intranasal kit is on the left-hand side, and the intramuscular um, injection kits were on the right-hand side. And so um, our senior consultant in, in the Office of Mental Health um, Services uh, and, uh, in suicide prevention looked at this and said, hey, this is something we should start looking into. So remember, we're in our time capsule, 2012. So I, at the time, was six months pregnant, and it um, looks like I'm about to pop there. And so I was like, you know, I'll look into this. I'll start looking into this. So. What were the challenges we had to face at that time? Again, this is a long time ago, before it was on NPR all the time. What was the evidence base? Right now, what we had at that point was we knew that there was a public health approach to doing this, but how does that translate into a healthcare-based approach? Okay, and so what we did is I um, talked to all the leaders when we talk about partnerships. My com community partners are really the backbone. We are standing on the shoulders of giants, and those giants were community-based programs. And so I spoke with Eliza Wheeler, Alex Wally, Sharon Stancliffe. These were leaders, international leaders in this area. And um, so the top row are all kind of leaders in, health, uh, in public health approaches to this. And at the bottom, we, again, we're starting to figure out, like, how do we translate this to healthcare? So um, the bottom right-hand side is Al, uh, Andrew McCauley, who's out of Scotland. Scotland was standing up around this time a national naloxone program. So we spoke with him to find out, you know, what were they doing? They were primarily focused on the same types of um, patients that the public health programs were interested in, which were patients um, who were using illicit opioids. They did not have a prescription drug issue in Scotland. Totally different case in the US, which I'll show you next. But we had to learn from kind of these pilot programs. So um, Philip Kaufman from, the San Francisco, from San Francisco was piloting um, OE&D among chronic pain patients. Uh, Fort Bragg was adopting Project Lazarus. So we had to talk to people who were just initially uh, initiating some of these programs. And so in the context of all this, at the time, it, it has changed just dramatically in six years. But at the time, prescription opioids were what was the leading opioid overdose. These days, it's 
carfentanyl, fentanyl, illicitly manufactured fentanyl that's tainting um, illicit substance use uh, supplies. But back then, when we were starting out, we realized, okay, you know, we were under a lot of pressure about our prescribing and about patients overdosing on these things. And so, again, remember, at this time, we had no models of how best to do this from a healthcare-based perspective and to target patients prescribed opioids. So uh, we're still in our time machine, 2013. There was um, a Human Rights Watch article that came out that documented the first pilot programs for OEND. And so Eric Konecki from the Cleveland VA was the first to get naloxone in OEND into VA. And this was in August 2013. So aptly named No Time to Waste, it would very much identify we need to do something. Again, you can see this was really talking about drug dependence. Again, one population of patients. And so what we realized in helping stand up these programs was that there were delays in people being able to start it. Because remember, there were no commercial kits. It wasn't like you could say, hey, I want to do naloxone, and there's a vendor that sells these things. No, we had to figure out how do we get this, how do we standardize it, and that sort of thing. So thankfully, so remember, first OEND program, August 2013. Um, we realized right away we needed a national initiative. So Dan Kiblihan, who was um, then the director of addictive disorders, and Francine Goodman, who was in pharmacy, so you have mental health and pharmacy, said, hey, we should try to start a national initiative. Mike Valentino, the head of PBM, was fully supportive of this, and really we wouldn't be where we are today without PBM support. And so Mario Franchi here, um, who's at the uh, Consolidated Male Outpatient Pharmacy, he and his staff figured out how can we make standardized kits so that any veteran across the VA, no matter where they're at, can get the same kit. Doesn't matter if you're in Alaska, in the Philippines, and we have shipped to the Philippines, um, you can get these kits. And so. We standardized that, that was the first big thing, so that any v veteran across VA could get it. And then we're like, how do we train providers who remember nobody, how many of you are medical providers? Just raise of hands. How many of you got training in how to do naloxone and overdose education in medical school, in your training? before the national, nobody. So basically we needed people, boots on the ground to train providers on how to do this. And so academic detailing has been really the backbone in training providers on how to initiate all of this. And during this course, I also realized we are lacking an evidence base. It was very clear. And so Query, thankfully, funded and uh, right away, I, got, I think it got funded 20, um, it got funded first round, which for those of you who are grant writers, very rarely do you ever get funded first round, but they recognize the need as well. And so we started studying. I talked to patients, I talked to providers, and then that led into developing a national toolkit for how to do this, and this was all a one-year project. And so this um, is, I have, the, the national work group has been meeting since January of 2014. This is a picture of us presenting. We work very closely. So in this picture, you have the director of pain management, director of, a, um, of substance use disorder treatment. You have um, primary care leaders who are in there, and also pharmacy folks in there. So this is really a concerted effort. A lot of people not pictured in there, but just wanted to show we, we continue to work together to make sure we tackle this epidemic. And so again, the two, remember, so the strongest evidence base was for um, individuals with substance use disorders or that were using opioids. And so we had programming, patient education tailored to that population, which is choose before you use opioid overdose prevention. These are our patient ed brochures. We tailored that for patients prescribed opioids very early on. This is our opioid safety brochure. We translated that because basically naloxone is really hard to self-administer, so you have to train um, caregivers in this. So we, we have these translated into um, Spanish. And my father, who's a, a first-generation Mexican-American who served in Desert Storm, he helped with actually validating it. And so um, and my stepmom, who has a, a second-grade um, education, was also helpful and he said, um, in, in making sure that she could even understand that. So it was pretty much an amazing kind of, again, uh, group effort to really try to figure out how we can best do this. Our attention to this, the issue of patients prescribed opioids early on, again, at the assumption of the program, I didn't mention it, but we went from August 2013, the first pilot, to national implementation April 2014. How many of you have ever heard of any national program that has gone to scale in that amount of time? Never, and it's because everybody who works on this is passionate about it, knows that we have, again, like that Human Rights Watch, no time to waste. And so this was um, something that we've been doing for a while. And so a CDC article just came out. This is just to give you a sense of how, um, how this has made a difference. CDC MMWR, or Vital Signs article came out a couple um, months ago. 
they found that for one, uh, for, uh, there was one naloxone prescription for every 69 high-dose opioid prescriptions. This is in retail pharmacies. In VA, one in five. This is what our attention to this from the outset for the last five years, this makes a difference. And all of you here who are practicing, who have supported your colleagues in this, it's because of you guys that we are able to stand up here and, and, and give these numbers. And so um, now we're going to fast forward. So we're in present time. My son's seven. We've been looking at this for seven years, so I wanted to give you guys an idea. So he is now seven. And what have we done in VA in those seven years? So we have gotten naloxone to over 205,000 veterans. We have over 800 reversals reported, 800 potential lives saved from this intervention. And so we know that naloxone reverses the leading cause of accidental death. There's no question about that. The newer formulations are easy to use. We have um, the nasal spray. Now you actually have vendors. You have pharmaceutical companies. You have these things. You can order them. So these are 90% um, of people can use these without any training, easy to use. Not only that, because of CARE legislation in 2016, at-risk VA patients can get this for free. So if you know of any veterans, any VA patients, anybody you know that could benefit from this, they can get it for free from VA. And so in closing, opioid overdose death we know is preventable. And my call to action to you is to encourage at-risk veterans to seek OAND. It's for free. They can get it for free if they're um, an at-risk VA patient. We have lots of uh, materials online for people who are trying to scale this up in other organizations. And also, if you have a loved one, um, learn more about it. You could be a, a lifesaver. You could be the one to respond. You could be the one called on to actually save a life. So um, thank you again. And yeah, let me know. I'll be around all, all week. So I'm um, happy to answer questions. Good morning. <clears throat> How many of you in the audience have had a close friend or a family member who's had a misdiagnosis? Or yourselves? Almost a third of you raised your hand. Thank you for raising your hand and responding. So anybody can tell me what this number might mean in healthcare? Any guesses? According to our research, 12 million patients are misdiagnosed every year in the United States alone. About half of these are potentially harmful. One of the people who was harmed about two decades ago when he presented with neck pain was Pat Sheridan. I want you to listen to Sue Sheridan, which is Pat's wife, describe the consequence of his misdiagnosis. So we finally went to an orthopedic doctor and they found a mass in his cervical spine. Pat had um, surgery. It was significant surgery. Physician came out and said it's a benign tumor. So we weren't worried. About five months after surgery, we learned that the tumor was back. Pat went through every kind of treatment that he could go through. But they, they couldn't save his life. In the hospital, we were visited by multiple physicians asking why Pat hadn't had treatment after the first surgery. Considering we were told it was a benign tumor, it didn't make sense to me. We recognized that a huge error had taken place. The final pathology from the first surgery was discovered to be malignant cancer. It never got back to us or apparently to the neurosurgeon. The kind of cancer that Pat had was treatable. Had that communication loop got closed, I think my husband would be alive. Really tragic. Notice what Sue said at the end. Had that communication loop gotten closed, her husband would have been alive. So how do we close these communication loops in healthcare? So I want to take you back to Houston, where about a decade and a half ago, we started asking this question. Simple question. Could technology help us close the communication loop? Now that we have electronic health records, it's easy to get an information about a test result, such as a biopsy or a chest x-ray, which is abnormal from point A to point B, because now we get this information directly in our electronic health records and we can see it right on our desktop. However, what we found was about 8% of abnormal test results are still lost to follow up at 30 days, which means we're not able to close the loop on those 8% of patients. So as researchers, one project leads to another, and we're very curious, how can we solve the problem that we just found? 
So what we decided was, let's create a solution which is based on information technology. Can we use information technology to identify those 8% of those patients uh, who are getting lost to follow up at 30 days? So essentially, we created what's called e-triggers, electronic triggers, which are, same, which are algorithms. You apply the algorithms in massive electronic health record data sets to identify just the patients who have had an abnormal test but have not had a follow-up action. So somebody who has a chest x-ray, for instance, it's abnormal, but 30 days later, if they have not had a follow-up action, that's the type of patients we want to flag through these e-triggers or electronic triggers. It's essentially like finding needles in a haystack by making the haystack smaller and using a magnet to pull out those needles. And then, as researchers, we also like to create impact and scale. Innovation is about scale, right? So we said, if this can work in Houston, can we take this to another network? So we took our work to Vision 12, Network 12 in the VA, the area around Chicago, and we applied our algorithms in the data warehouse, electronic health record data warehouse in Vision 12, and we found good predictive value, good accuracy. So instead of, uh, imagine reviewing 300,000 medical records to identify just the few patients who were getting lost to follow up, we only had to review a few hundred medical records to identify the patients who had been lost to follow up because the computer and the information technology was able to flag these patients for us and do the job uh, of identifying some of these patients. Now, innovation is not only about technology and tools. It's also about making technology and tools work in a complex and messy healthcare system that we practice in. And so what we were finding, despite the use of these electronic triggers and flagging patient medical records in order to take action, we were still unable to close the loop in all the patients. And the reasons for that, you can imagine, were things that were not related to technology. People, workflow issues, leadership, culture, organizational policies and processes. So all of those have to be addressed in order to make this innovation work in healthcare systems. So then we come up with another concept, our new innovation is the concept of lead organizations. Essentially what we are proposing is a model, organization transformation model, that can be used to create organizational momentum where the healthcare organizations need to do five steps that we're proposing in order to create what's called the LEAD organizations. LEAD stands for Learning and Exploration or Diagnostic Excellence. Some of the things that the LEAD organizations would do, create virtual teams in order to learn, identify and learn from these missed opportunities. We don't have those teams right now in most healthcare systems, specifically dedicated to tracking missed test results. Second, create new measurement platforms, such as e-triggers, because measurement is one of the first steps to improvement, right? But we don't have the current metrics. Our current metrics, it's also called tyranny of metrics, we are not measuring things related to misdiagnosis and to test results. And we need to be able to change that. And thirdly, is to create those feedback loops that I talked about. You can have all the great data in the world, but if you're not gonna take any action on that data and create food feedback loops and learn from that data, that data is no good. So we wanna create these feedback loops as well. So now you're wondering, how do I go from box one to box three? So the box one being uh, the bronze age of misdiagnosis that we're currently in to a golden era of patient safety improvement. So this, the problem of misdiagnosis is an urgent one, it's a compelling one, it's a moral, professional, and public health imperative that we must tackle it. I would suggest all healthcare organizations need to create this lead organization structure, um, put into place safety tracking systems where we can identify patients like Pat. That's what's going to help us close the communication loops and save patients like Pat. Thank you very much for listening. I want to uh, give a shout out to my team in Houston and as well as my research funding organizations in the VA. Thank you so much for having me. Hello, everyone. My name is Kim Taylor, and I am the surgery nurse manager at the Martinsburg VA Medical Center. And I'm going to talk to you about InformaVet. It's our text messaging tool. 
So now in surgery, we do a good job of making sure everything is right for the patient for the day of surgery. We make sure everybody is there, the implants, the equipment, the sterile instruments, everything. We leave no stone unturned. However, we leave out one important element, and that's the family member. So I'm going to share with you a scene that some of you had probably witnessed or you probably experienced. And it's called the breakdown. How are we gonna miss my rehearsal? I know, Olivia. I promised your mom that I would take you, but we have to stay until someone tells me what's going on. I'm hungry. I know, I know. It's been so long. How come no one has told us anything? Here, I'll tell you what. Eat this, eat this, I eat this. Want them. I know. I want ice cream. Okay, okay. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hey mom. No. I haven't heard anything yet. Yes. Hey, I have to call you back. Uncle Joe is calling. Bye, bye, bye. Hey, Uncle Joe. Joe? You know, I have not heard anything. No. Okay, 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 okay. Bye, bye, bye. Honey, I don't know what's going on. I, I know. I don't know why. We can't leave. I'm so I sorry. I know. I know. So, how many of you all have witnessed that or have experienced that? Me too. So one of the things, so we're going to talk about that scene a little bit. And if you notice the mother, she was frustrated, she was agitated, she's nervous, no one's telling her anything. Or maybe you can relate to the child. You're tired. You're hungry. You're going to miss something important. Why? Because you have to stay in that waiting room. Or maybe you can relate to the person on the phone. You're calling, you're trying to find out what is going on with your family member. Again, I call it the breakdown because why? They had an emotional breakdown, but there was also a breakdown in communication with the surgical team and the family members. So here I am. How did all this begin? So picture with me, I'm in CVS. Sorry, CVS. I'm in CVS, I am waiting, and I'm waiting. I'm waiting, I have somewhere to go. I'm hungry, I'm tired, I am frustrated. Sounds familiar? But then I see a sign. It says, receive text messages to pick up your prescription. I said, what? Eureka, I can use this for surgery. So I want you to uh, meet Mary, and that's her husband, Mike. This is a personal experience that happened at the Martinsburg VA Medical Center. So Mike, it was his first time having surgery. So of course, him and Mary, they're both nervous and afraid. Mary was nervous about how we were going to communicate with her about her husband during his phase of surgery. Um, he was scheduled for a procedure lasting about two hours, and then he would be discharged home. So during the admission process, we um, asked Mary, do you want to receive text messages during your husband's surgical procedure? It would tell you about when the procedure started, it's still in progress, when he's going to recovery. And not only that, we can tell anybody else the same messages in Texas, in Michigan, whoop, that's where I'm from, and in, or Florida, wherever, they will receive the same text messages so that you won't be having those phone calls from Uncle Mike, right? So there she is, she's waiting. She's receiving these text messages. Unfortunately, the procedure lasted three hours longer than expected. But during this time, Mary was able to go to the canteen. She was able to walk around the campus. She did not have to stay in that waiting room. So the provider noticed that it took a little bit longer. So what he did was he told us, hey, send Mary a text telling her to come back to the waiting room. We talked to her face to face and explained, your husband is doing great. It was some minor complications, but he's doing fine. Mary told us something that we want to hear from every family member. If I didn't receive these text messages, I would have lost my mind. That is, that is wonderful, right? So. At the Martinsburg VA, we have had a 98.9 .9 customer satisfaction because the InformaVet gives timely updates using effective communication, and guess what? It gives a peace of mind. That's some of my um, team members. Without them, I would not have had this happen. 
Um, and then, so where are we now? Right now, um, we are implemented in the four vi um, vision facilities within our Vision 5. We have six other sites that have reached out to me about more information. Um, our future plans are to use it in our transportation. We're in a rural community, so it would give um, our vets arrival times, departure text, when the van is leaving, when it's coming, once of using the lab, pharmacy, post-op um, follow-up where the nurses can um, send the uh, patient text messages. Also, pre-procedure as well, stay MPO, do not eat anything, right? And also use for discharge planning. So again, if you don't remember anything else about Informa Bet, a peace of mind is just a text away. And again, I'm Kim Taylor. Thank you. I don't want to get in the way of uh, plugging Martinsburg, so go Martinsburg. Um, I'm Amanda Purnell, and I am here to talk with you about human-centered design and how human-centered design is changing the VA. My experience is that people come to work for the VA because you care. You believe in the mission. You know that our veterans deserve excellence. And so when you run into this, you say, there has got to be a better way. And so you think to yourself, I've got an idea. I'm going to do something different. And you're sent in a dizzying array of directions. They say to you, good idea, but. Has another VA done this before? Oh. <laughs> Wait, we, we can't do that. That wasn't our VA. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, um, um, I know there's a directive. I know there's. Oh. Okay, I think there's a directive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That actually happened to me. You're left feeling confused, lost, and discouraged. But what if, instead of no and but, you experienced yes and? Absolutely. Doesn't that feel so much better? <laughs> this is the mindset, the heart set of human-centered design, the mindset of the possible. And what is human-centered design? It's taking those people, understanding their context, and helping them to solve problems. And I've spent all this time, and I haven't yet talked to you about an actual person, so I'm going to do that next. I want to tell you a story about three fantastic human beings who work at my facility, April Conway, Jacob Herzog, and Fifi Yuma. Fifi Yuma had a project idea, and she was determined to fix it. But not only did she show up to my pitch workshop, she brought April. April didn't even know the pitch workshop was happening. She's a busy provider. She just showed up. And that day forward, one year ago, she is here today presenting and how she is changing the conversation around sexual health and fertility for our veterans with spinal cord injury. Jacob was scared to talk in front of an audience. If he would have been in my shoes, he would be a little trepidatious. 
through his team believing in him and trying to understand how they could provide even better care, he stood up in front of the executive team and he now has three projects that are moving forward and I can hardly keep up with all that he's doing. But it's not just at the St. Louis VA. This is happening at VAs around the country. Raise your hand if you have attended a human-centered design workshop. Leave your hands up. Look around the room. Wow, look at that spread. Over 2,000 people have attended a human-centered design workshop. Sometimes it's 30 minutes, sometimes it's two hours, sometimes you can make it all the way through a two-day workshop. But this is the power, one training at a time, one post-it note on the wall at a time. We're engaging and empowering our staff. But don't listen to me. Let's hear from some more people who've attended a workshop. This is Kristen Mate and Sheena Strong. They attended a workshop led by Liz Williams, the fantastic innovation specialist at the Gulf Coast Veterans Healthcare System. You know what they said? They said, this training helped connect me to the people who would help me to do what I needed to do. And it's not just wishful thinking. This can really be done. How powerful is that? This can really be done. And who are those people leading those trainings? There are people in this audience. If you have ever led a human-centered design training, can you stand up? Or co-led, you know. Look. So now hopefully you're curious. Those of you who didn't get a chance to raise your hand earlier saying you've already attended a human-centered design training, find one of these folks and they will help you. You can sit down. <laughs> We're just like you. The people who are leading these trainings are embedded in facilities around the country. We're looking at the context from close up. We understand the logistical challenges that you all are facing. And we're here to help you. And together, we can imagine the possible. Thank you. Let's give all of our IEX speakers another big round of applause. Thank you. So if you a, are very enthused by uh, the idea of human-centered design, what it means, and B, you really love post-it notes. Um, in the Zenger room, which is kind of across, directly across from where we are, we have, uh, as part of Innovators Network, we have created an exhibit called Hack the Network. And it is essentially a giant human-centered design uh, mini workshop where we have already uh, identified and interviewed stakeholders, done some of the interviewing process um, to start the design process for changes that are gonna happen in Innovators Network and how you can participate and how you can make Innovators Network um, better. We are always trying to expand and find new ways to spread what we're doing Three box solution training, human centered design, empowering employees, building that innovative culture throughout VA. We want to know what you all think. So, in between sessions this afternoon at lunch, which is happening right after another short video, um, go and play with some post its, play with your ideas, design part of uh, the innovators network of the future, that box three innovators network. So, after um, this next short video, uh, it is lunch, and we will see you back after that for an exciting afternoon. Thank you all so much. I choose the VA because they've put their time and energy into making my leg become whole again. I choose VA because I love serving veterans. I choose the VA because I want to give access to care to female veterans. I choose VA 
because I help survivors of military sexual trauma. I choose VA because I know the VA is committed to leaving no veteran behind. Choose VA today. For more information, visit va.gov.